you know, like a good young officer, I, I said, look, this battery is the best and this one is the worst. And the worst happened to be my own battery. Every officer goes into it. This podcast is going to be for two hours, 30 minutes, but even more. This is by far the longest podcast I've done on this channel. This channel does not stand for short, ill-researched, dopamine-infusing content. And I mean this. Each and every story in this pod is so beautifully articulated that it will be a crime to not let you watch it in its entirety. The real life is a lot different from the real life that's usually shown in the movies and the pop culture that might inspire people to join the armed forces, rightfully so. so in terms of your experiences and observations, what could be the stark differences between the real life that's shown in the movies versus the real life that's actually there in the armed forces? I think you spoke uh, briefly about the suicide cases as well in the Indian armed forces. How prevalent is that and what are the reasons for it? There are also another breed of people who are husband and wife both in the forces. Right? And the armed forces adjust them in, by saying that, look, every alternate posting will try to get you together. Winston Churchill once parked, I repeat, Winston Churchill once parked, that India is merely a geographical expression. It is no more a single country than the equator. Churchill was rarely right about India, but it is true that no other country in the world embraces the extraordinary mixture of ethnic groups the profusion of mutually incomprehensible languages that India does. And one entity that is the epitome of India's unity in diversity is the mighty Indian Armed Forces. In fact, during the war with Pakistan in 1971, the Indian Air Force in the northern sector was commanded by a Muslim, Air Chief Marshal Latif. The Indian Army was headed by a Parsi, General Sahmanik Shah, the Eastern Command of the Indian Army, was commanded by Lieutenant General Jacob, a Jew, and the person who made Pakistanis to surrender and signed the instrument of surrender, who you can also see in the picture, is Lieutenant General Jagjit Singh Arora, a Sikh. And at the end of the day, they were all Indians, fighting, living, dying for Mother India. There is no religion, no caste, no creed in the Indian Armed Forces. Welcome to the Season 1 of the Money Heist Podcast. This podcast is going to be for 2 hours 30 minutes, or even more. This is by far the longest podcast I have done on this channel. This channel does not stand for short, ill-researched, dopamine-infusing content. And I mean this. Each and every story in this pod is so beautifully articulated that it will be a crime to not let you watch it in its entirety. So if you're taking a lunch break today, do not watch Netflix. Rather watch this pod, because you're going to learn so much about the functioning of the Indian Armed Forces, the civil-military relations in India, and why you should consider a career in the Indian Armed Forces. There will be moments where you will feel like dropping off, but do not, and watch it end to end. You can save it for later, but do come back to it, because in this podcast, we're going to cover the aspects of the Indian Armed Forces that you will not find anywhere in the world. Forget about the internet or YouTube. If you're thinking of building a career in the Indian Army and want to convince your parents that it is the right career for you, bring them in and watch with them together over lunch or dinner. Because in this podcast, we're also going to be talking about the foreign postings and international deputations in the Indian Army, training methodologies of the officers in the Indian Armed Forces, and how can civilians be part of the Indian Army via a TA unit, and what opportunities do Army officers have when they transition into the private sector. Additionally, we will also be covering the controversial topic of the representation of women in the Indian Armed Forces. And how does that affect or improve the security dynamics or incentive structure with the Indian Army? In this podcast, I'm absolutely delighted to invite my dear friend, Colonel Ibrahim Chirian, as he relives his life as an officer in the Indian Army. Indian Armed Forces are the military forces of the Republic of India. It consists of three professional uniformed services, the Indian Army, the Indian Navy, and the Indian Air Force. The President of India is the Supreme Commander of the Indian Armed Forces, but the executive authority for national security is vested in the Prime Minister of India and their chosen cabinet ministers. With strength of over 1.4 million active personnel, the Indian Armed Forces is the world's second largest military force and has the world's largest volunteer Army. The Global Firepower Index report lists Indian Armed Forces as the fourth 
most powerful military in the world. Upon the partition of India and the Indian independence in 1947, four of the ten Gurkha regiments were transferred to the British Army. The rest of the British Indian Army was divided between the newly created nation states of India and Pakistan. Initially, the army's main objective was to defend the nation's frontiers. However, over the years, the army has also taken up responsibilities of providing internal security, especially against the insurgencies in Kashmir and Northeast India. Currently, the army is also looking at enhancing its special forces capabilities, with India's increasing international role and the requirement to protect its interests in far-off countries becoming important. The Indian Army and the Indian Navy are jointly planning to set up a marine base. Hi everyone, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome my dear friend Ibrahim Cherian to the next episode of the Money Heist podcast. Ibrahim has had an extensive career in the Indian Armed Forces. He retired as a colonel in the Indian Army and thereafter worked with uh, leading private sector organizations after his graduation from one of my favorite policy schools, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. So, Ibrahim uh thank you so much for taking out time before starting the podcast a few minutes ago i was going through chat gpt hoping to get cues on the questions that i can ask from you so allegedly i wrote on chat gpt uh what can i ask a retired army professional in terms of the questions for a podcast uh for a podcast to go viral i for some reason could not come across great questions However, there was one question about some ball dance in the NDA and the IMA that we may speak of in some time. Uh, until then, I uh, would love to hear about you, about your story, your background, and uh, what made you join the Indian Army in the first place. Um, great question to begin with. Uh, yeah, uh, so that was a very, very long time ago, you know, 1988, uh, 89, when I was in high school in Kolkata. And... Uh, Uh, you know I, i was studying in a kendriya vidyalaya and this was inside an army uh, establishment in kolkata where we right in the middle of the city and most of my classmates and their fathers were in the army and they would sometimes come to pick them up or drop them in their uniforms with all those medals and like look like a christmas tree uh, so so that was really great right i mean people don't mostly don't join army because of this so called you know hindi movie thing about desh ke liye kuch karenge and all that they do it for other reasons and this is one of the reasons you look really good in a uniform with lots of medals and ribbons yeah that was that was a that was a big reason and the other thing was of course in the 80s we used to get these uh, commando comics i don't know if they're still around but there used to be these small black and white comic books about world war 2 and world war 1 and all that and they were really really exciting for some girls 14 15 years old and you know this is so, so you pick up from there and you say i want to do something like this mm-hmm. which is which is which is very different you know so so yeah these were these were the two main reasons i would say um and of course when you, when you really know what the army and Uh, and you know late 80s if you remember was a time before uh, li- economic liberalization and stuff and so for parents somebody was after after school not getting into engineering or mbbs was like uh, yeah okay and then you had nda and you know is and all these things used to be much later so yeah. so for a school student it was in the armed forces or going to become an engineer or a doctor and, and in fact my parents were very keen that i become an engineer and i got into the delhi school of delhi college of engineering but i dropped that i didn't want to go there <laughs> so yeah. so i i joined the nda uh, yeah that and the journey was not easy because for the first time when i went i applied for a naval engineering course that's in that runs out of uh, ins shivaji in lonawla Mm-hmm. right and and so it was engineering and the armed forces and so i said okay maybe it's it's something that my parents would probably approve of and i applied there went for the interview didn't make it and i came back again applied for nda didn't make it mm-hmm. in the interview and the third time you know i just spent in and and what really happened was that uh, you know two times that i went there was this uncle in our in our church Mm-hmm. who was a psychologist with the, you know he's used to be part of this uh, interview organization he was a psychologist so he said oh your son is appearing for he wants to go join the armed forces send him to me and i will train him on this interview all right so he coached me on all those responses that i should be giving to get selected and i didn't get selected you know i i get this response. and the third time that i went i said well, whatever the hell you know i'm not going to this guy i'll go and say whatever i want to Uh, and i don't care whether it's right or wrong and i went and said all of those things wrote all of 
all of those things and i got selected wow. so that's how it is <laughs> that's, that's wonderful so the army you uniform attracted you more than the uniform from the air force and the navy yeah yeah I, yeah you could say that you know i mean it's 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 like things change so somewhere mm-hmm. down my career you know when i was in the army i got attracted to flying so i wanted to become an army pilot mm-hmm. um which which really didn't work out but that's another story uh but then yeah at that point you know the idea was to to, to join the army yeah okay so i would want to delve deeper into into the aspect of joining the armed forces we will talk about the pop culture and the influence it has on in attracting the talent and i see the pr of the indian army and of course of the various other armed forces and how they collaborate with the pop culture in ensuring that the great talent eventually gets attracted and the indian army and the armed forces has done an incredible job there but you spoke about the fact that you dropped out of the delhi college of engineering again the foremost colleges uh, in india for to pursue engineering degree uh, to join the nda were your parents happy about the choice that you made and uh, uh, what decisions <laughs> Is, what parameters did you consider in in doing that so i i didn't drop out of the college but i applied and getting through and i said no I, i you know i'm not going to go through this whole thing and and i'm not joining right and i went and joined it here at that point i think it's it's just you know when you're in school and you know, your parents look at what is the safest and the best option for your you know their their children to become successful or well off and you know stuff like that you know, mostly and and then the and when you uh, you know depends on what kind of a background you come from and mm-hmm. and you say oh you got to make it in life and you know do that and this is the way to do it you either become a doctor incidentally my sister's a doctor mm-hmm. she's in she's in america uh, so so you know the typical paths like you do you know, struggle getting to the best mbbs college in, in the country and then you go and do all of that uh but then you know this was this was like i think there was a lot of passion involved in it because i went through this process three times before i was successful so mm-hmm. you know i mean you could, i could have just given up so that's the lesson that i learned there you know you got to be persistent with things and you'll get it and and, and that's something that is a lesson for all the youngsters my daughter is now 21 years old she's about to come out of college and that's the thing that i tell her that, look if you give up too soon you've got to go you know you know you're not going to get what you want and so when you join the first one month is especially very very bad and they they've designed it that way because they want people who are a little faint hearted to kind of drop out and it's not it's not cheap to drop out because uh, you know when we joined one week of training was some 11000 rupees or something which you had to pay if you drop out of so if you drop out of four weeks you pay what 55 45000 rupees right and that was a lot of money in in 1990 because i remember the the secretary to the government of india is to get some 12000 rupees a month mm-hmm. right. perhaps in trip is a big amount so for us you know all of my coachmates all of us will like first yeah. one month is really tough on physical and you know you you never really work your muscles and all of that and they may they don't let you sleep and the only thing that held out was that look if he drop out and go home my my father's going to really sort me out because he's going to spend a lot of money to to get me out of this place right <laughs> and so we just hung on kind of just mm-hmm. gritted our teeth and just hung on and then that took us through the rest of four years oh fantastic so for the nda exam i think so there are many various routes to enter the indian armed forces for all the services the two most prominent ones are the nda the exam that is conducted by the upsc and then you later appear for the ssps the second one is the option for folks who have who already have a graduate degree and they participate via the cds exam and the afcat so on and so forth with you the route was the nda and as per my research almost all the um, leaders in the in, in the indian army they all come from the nda route and rarely from the cds route because they got in the the armed forces at a very early early age so were you able to crack the written exam all the three times and you were plankering yeah. only in the interviews yes uh, all the three times i mean the written things written exam was not a problem for me mm-hmm. um and i always got i think i got called in the first batch of interviews right so for me personally written exam was not a problem because i was i was always kind of good at math and um i read a lot you know i started reading when i was in fifth class mm-hmm. in fact yesterday somebody posted uh, on linkedin you know dominique lapier passed away 
who is a guy who wrote the book is paris burning and the city of joy i read that book when i was in 7th class or 8th class so that's really really long so so i used to read a lot so english was not a problem math was you know i was good at and these are the two main things in the india exam no hmm. in the in the written exam like the gmat and the gre right so 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 it was kind of uh, yes not difficult i mean it was not difficult for me to do the written exam in fact i remember the time that i actually passed and joined mm-hmm. i was sick the day of the exam and i was kind of frustrated because i had not cleared the interview the last two times and i said i don't want to go and you know i don't want i don't want to go for the exam and my father said look you applied for it already the exam is today why don't you just go and write it mm-hmm. it doesn't matter I don't want to join it's okay or you you know you don't just go and do it so i went and i was sick and i went and gave the exam and i it just got <laughs> Oh, fantastic. So you appeared for the exam, you cracked the written part multiple times. You tried for the interviews yeah. multiple times and eventually got succeeded in the third attempt. Yes. And that's phenomenal. So once you got, what do you call it, conference in, uh, after five days, yeah. uh, the medicals happened and you were eventually shortlisted. So how was those waiting period for you before you started your training? And do tell us yeah. where does the training take place and uh, how was it like thereafter? Yes, um, really interesting because I... you know i got through the, the assessment results actually came i was it was my birthday and i was in bangalore you know and just four days of this interview and all of that and and then they in the morning they said okay is this so many these other people are through there were i think four of us from out of a batch of 35 in that in the on that day and then there was this from april till june or, uh, you know end of june is when you you're sitting and waiting and then you have this merit list which comes out and people generally say you know if you made it in the interview and you've gone to the interview in the first few batches then you're generally you're you're there right so, so i was not really too worried about it and at that point i remember that i was also studying for my iit and all of that and you know those exams and stuff so at that point bc used to be uh, you know based on your 12th class scores it was not an entrance exam it was based on your 12th class course and iits were at those entrance exams and i was studying this agarwal classes and all that every day i used to sit and do some 200 physics and mathematics problems and all of that and i stopped doing that right i just went back and i said no i'm done <laughs> i stopped doing that my and my mother said look what is this you know you've been studying for the last one year for this you just stopped you've not got the merit list yes i said no i i think i'm confident i'll make it in. you know it's just that that six sense or something which said that look i'm through this now. i'm going so I stopped and they were worried you know you know nothing has happened and this guy has stopped studying for his engineering which is what he should be doing mm-hmm. uh, but you know after a month this whole you know list comes out and and uh, you know i was there you know, which is a happy moment and it, the prep, prep time is really good because in that list you know they'll tell you you have to get two ties and so many shirts and so many trousers and you, if you like to play tennis you get your tennis racket and mm-hmm. it's all very different things from what you know happens today people are exposed to a lot of stuff like this right in, in those times it was a novelty they said you got to bring a bring a small alarm there's a detailed list right arm forces are very very diligent in in what they do mm-hmm. so so a list of how many pens to carry and how many undergarments to carry and how many shoes to carry yeah. and what specifications so all of that you know you go and start buying all of that and 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 prepare yourself so it was a really great time yeah well and where did this training place was it in the i may there dun or it's the so in pune so training is in pune right pune, yeah. uh, it's in kadakwasla Yeah. It's outskirts of Pune, no longer the outskirts of course. Uh, time and for how many years did the training take place? And what it's, was it's the three years? Three years. And uh, in terms of the training curriculum, what does it look like? And uh, how yeah. is it different from a regular guy studying at the at IIT Delhi college. or yeah. so on and so forth? Yeah, uh, it's it's very different. It's not like college. I mean, at the end of it, in three years, you are supposed to go through a BSc or a BA curriculum. At, uh, It, that's there right and but in addition to what you do like i was a bsc cadet a science cadet and so i i had to do maths and physics and uh, chemistry and and the stuff but in india they believe in you know this this sort of a well rounded uh, exposure to stuff so for the first uh, i think two years we also had to study the cross stream subjects so do mm-hmm. economics and geography and history and you know so first two years and then you also do stuff like uh, computer science and in our fourth term we had this uh, whole thing with uh, machining and tools uh, and workshop so we actually i actually built a gear right mm-hmm. they teach you how to do that they look you you do this 
engineering drawings and then you go and build that in a lathe machine mm -hmm. uh, and you have carpentry and foundry so you would imagine why would an nda cadet or an armed forces officer need to do all this it's really exposing you to all all those aspects of uh, you know basic engineering which you were going to apply later which you mm -hmm. realize that yes you really you know it's good to be exposed to that also learn a foreign language so i learned german you know at that time 1991 mm -hmm. germany you know the us star was breaking up uh, the great wall came down actually on mm -hmm. a day when we were standing on parade going in for the graduation parade not us but you know we were juniors and the and the adjutant of the academy rode in on a horse right and you know in his uniform and all that and he comes and says hey, there is there is this really great news today there's something phenomenal has happened in the world mm -hmm. and the berlin wall has come down wow. right and i remember we were standing going in for that parade and he mm -hmm. told us this yeah so in terms of curriculum it's really you know this is what what i told you is academic mm -hmm. but the real training is not academic it is yeah. all done by senior cadets so nda has you know these 15 squadrons so by the way this this mug that you see here hunter hunters, hunters my squadron mm -hmm. right so we call ourselves head hunters and i still have this mug because i went for a reunion a couple of years ago and you know got this there so in in a squadron there are these first to six termers you know everybody's mixed together we live in a building everybody has a cabin of their own and the officers do not do too much of training you're from about 4:30 in the morning till about 11 in the night 95% of your time is spent with your seniors in training there is formal physical training in the morning which is done by you know the the instructors by, and and drill and stuff like that but you come back from classes about 2 o'clock mm -hmm. and then till about 6:30 you are inside the squad and you 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 know you are either going for more physical training games cross country boxing you know and all of this is supervised by your seniors not by your the the instructor officers or the mm -hmm. or the uh, you know ncos and all that so it's all so what like, are the you know, so what are the advantages and disadvantages when your seniors are taking taking the charge and not the formal professors yeah so you know i mean the, you, it's, it's a mix of things right for formal drill where they teach you how to salute and where you teach you how to do your sword drill and where rifle drill and stuff there are instructors and you've seen adequate videos on youtube about you know they started floating around recently with your seniors you're also learning how to really become leaders with with within your team you know because you're seeing how a six term up behaves you know and how how this person is getting things done and getting things on this as you know one of the things is cross country very very prestigious competition in india to win that trophy is very very prestigious and it's not that the the first five guys come in and they get all the points for your squad and it's the entire 125 people mm -hmm. and all of them cannot get medals so there is a strategy involved right that uh, uh, and in cross country in india what happens is you're dividing them everybody into the two minute slots right mm -hmm. two minute enclosures starting from the first guy so if somebody is coming in the fourth enclosure he's not a loser because this this person tries and gets into the third enclosure which is the next higher one yeah. this person is earning two more points so the strategy is all about getting everybody into the next higher enclosure right and this is all done by the senior cadets not by the, it's not done by the officers and all that it's all mm -hmm. within the team so you learn a lot about how to really get your team together get them going how to deal with failures because somebody does come 15th everybody doesn't come first or second right so so you i know that we've come 15th in our fourth term or third term mm -hmm. we came 15th last and then in the next term we came second or was it the first mm -hmm. so so we've seen those kind of things and how people have turned it around so that, that's really the interesting exciting part and this is fascinating so at a very young age 17 18 19 you every cadet is put into such a hard pressing situation is competing with other teams is part of a team so i'm sensing the bonds that you make at that that age are going to last forever has that been the case for you as well yes i can give an example right last yeah. month a, a postmate of mine from india and he called me up and he posted somewhere in north india he says my daughter's in christ university and there is some problem with her um uh so registration or some stuff and and you know we're not able to reach them and she she has to join in january and something i just picked up my car went there talked to those people it was a one hour drive for me but i went there talked to those people connected them on phone with him and his daughter and resolved the thing okay mm -hmm. and the last i met this guy is i think 15 years ago 
17 years old. So, so no questions asked. That's the bond, right? I mean, somebody says, can you help me? There's nothing like, oh, no, I'm busy and all that. No, no, you've mm-hmm. got to do it. You get it done. Wow. Right. So that's that's phenomenal. So for for the three years, you are studying liberal arts, you're studying computer sciences, you're competing in sporting activities, you're learning foreign languages. And that's how you spend your time in the NDA for the first three years. Uh, just out of curiosity, would you be aware of how the training would differ for those who join in after their graduation or via CDS? Or is it going? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I also went to IMA, right? IMA is like post-graduation. It's the grad school of uh, the armed forces, army. So army cadets... Okay, got it. So let's let's hold on to it. So we'll talk about this. So we start with the NDA. We finish three years in the NDA. Then what happens? Then you graduate from there. It's called the passing out, passing out parade. And all the army cadets go to IMA, right? All of them. And the naval cadets go to, they used to go to a ship called INS Tir at that time, I don't know, might have changed. Uh, they do the naval training before they become naval officers. And the Air Force, they just go and start learning how to fly. Like most of them, everybody starts with flying. Those who do their solo and, you know, have the aptitude, they continue. Otherwise, others go into engineering or other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so we do that. And when we reach IMA, no, I'll, I'll stick to IMA, right? When you reach IMA, as, uh, we join a second termers. Right. Those who are direct entries, the CDS guys, they do mm-hmm. three terms there. So our batchmates who have done the direct uh, entry have already done their first term in IMA. And they join second term and we come in as second termers. From so NDA. hold on. So when you are done with the NDA, you join in as a second termer in the IMA. Yeah. And for those who join in via the CDS or other ancillary exams after graduation, they join in as the first term. As first term, okay. yes. And when they finish their first term, they, you know, you, you you kind of join in together with the NDA guys who come in directly mm-hmm. as second termers, and then you become one batch in IMA. Got it. Got it. Huh? So they do one and a half years. We do one year in IMA. Ex India do it. one year. Got it. So one year in IMA. How does that look like? And before that, and before that, uh, yeah. so after NDA, I'm sensing you will also be specializing in certain disciplines, or is it all common? All the specializations yeah, so you're just, you're just an army cadet. You're okay. just an army, army cadet, and and you go there, and it's only after IMA that you really go into you know whatever arm or service you go into, right? So IMA is like a, it's entirely army focused. And NDA is, you know, that's the difference, right? NDA is not about your with Army, Navy, or Air Force. It's about building leadership. It's only about that, that, right? In fact, you it's only in the sixth term that you actually fire a rifle in NDA. Mm-hmm. It's very little, right? I mean, you don't start, you, you have a rifle to yourself to do drill, it doesn't fire. Only in the sixth term, if you're an Army cadet, you'll fire a rifle. If you're an Air Force cadet, you used to have this glider and they do a gliding, you know, gliding sessions and stuff. In IMA, it's more about the Army. They'll start teaching you um, section level, basic tactics. They will teach you about other weapons, uh, you know, about the machine gun and mortars and, uh, you know, and then they will teach you more about patrolling, laying ambushes, doing other operations. You know, they'll take you into mountains and jungle warfare. So all of that stuff, along with these studies, connected to it. There are a lot of studies, you know, that you have to do. Uh, and it's focused purely on the army. They'll teach you about army culture and the organization and, and stuff like that. It's one year of that. And along with that is, of course, all of the other stuff, which is sports, mm-hmm. team, uh, you know, uh, team activities, competitions. They'll give you opportunities to become leaders within your within your course. And, you know, the final year term credits are normally they become appointments. Like, you know, your house in, in colleges, you may have some committees and you become members and all that mm-hmm. stuff. So in IMA, you have under officers and battalion credit adjutants and squadron under officers and CSM. CSM is like you would have seen in movies, right? Cadet sergeant major or company sergeant major, the guy who shouts the most and gets all the <laughs> things done. So I was a CSM in IMA, right? Okay. Uh, how to behave, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was a job given to me and so I had to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that's amazing. So all those who, so the acronym, the IMA is the Indian Military Academy. It's uh, one of the oldest institutions nestled in the beautiful valleys of Dehradun. Back when India was not independent, the early generals of the Pakistani armed forces, even they trained in the IMA. Yes. And currently, I think it before the Taliban took over, even the Afghanistani cadets used to train in the IMA, right? 
yes they they come to nda as well a um, lot of credit people come from uh, sri lanka uh, afghanistan bhutan and there there are many other countries that you know they they come train oh that's wonderful so ibrahim so between ima and nda which one where did you have the most fun most fun um nda i mean for me it was nda and i think most ex nda's would say that um you know because NDA is a place where but you were not firing guns in the NDA you were doing that in the IMA yeah. yeah we did that in the IMA you know firing machine guns and and the rocket launchers and all of that it's cheap to do all that but that's that's okay i mean that's that's not the the fun part is like when you very really build those bonds with the people um and you do a lot of fun things and you do a lot of stuff which which, which within the restricted environments highly highly restricted but Mm-hmm. you still go and you know are able to you know, to able to uh, do some fun stuff go on trips they organize these trips to really nice places in, in the you know it's called the midterm trip do that um i mean it's really very short right it's one year concentrated thing but it also has some really great i mean i i've carried some really great experiences from there in terms of leadership and i i also uh you know i have a leadership talk which i do in in the company that i work mm-hmm. in and and this is an example that i gave and maybe i can give it to you a little later uh, about how how we really you know leadership is all about taking decisions when there are ambiguous and env- if there's an ambiguous environment it's not really about black and white this is good this is bad no or this is this is going to help us and this is not going to help it's not like that it's always gray and and so in i may had this really great experience of doing that of actually being part of that and answering for that and you know uh, and and that was i think really the greatest experience that i had in and talk about it yeah. let's talk about it so five things that you absolutely uh, you know, or you can never forget about five experiences in the ima that are very hard for you to forget so I, could be could yes. be the terrible ones could be the great ones it's up yeah. to you on how you choose those so so maybe i'll start with two of them you mentioned the ball in nba and ima right so in ima our term when we were we were the final term cadets the first time that the balls really started this is 1993 june before that i didn't have a ball india had a ball all wrong you know go and look look for college girls in pune and try to get them to come with us uh, in fact my daughter was in college a couple of years ago in pune and same university and there was this cadet who came and says hey i'm from so and so student and you know and she says yeah my dad was in so and so student you know you want to talk to him <laughs> but in ima okay like they go there so they started this thing and they said they took out this announcement right that there's going to be a ball and uh, you know you can get your partners and and nobody's prepared for it because mm-hmm. we didn't know that this is going to happen it takes a lot of effort to get a girl to agree to come to you of course so the negotiation yeah. le- lessons and the communication lessons start very early yes. in the nda so so what i did yeah it starts right so what i did was there was very little time and there were no i mean it's not easy for you to find a girl when you can go out only on a sunday and mm-hmm. you can't just randomly go to a girl and say look can you come to the thing and you say who is this so there were, and this is also the time when the the lady officers the women officers had just started coming mm-hmm. so the first batch of women officers had just joined in march of 1993 after you know they just got commissioned and so the funny thing is that when you are a short service commission officer you do lesser training and so you also lose 6 months of seniority when you actually you know come out and yeah. so these lady officers are actually 6 months junior to us but they were they were already second lieutenants and they were you know they were there and we were about to graduate and so this lady also came for a class we had this academic classes she, she came to she was she was an instructor in some some subject so and i was the company sergeant major so i would got i got the class in order and i said okay i have to give the report right that everybody is mm-hmm. in and ready for the class and that's how it works in the army so i went with this 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 little girl you know was about 5 feet mm-hmm. the second lieutenant who seated mm-hmm. to me so i went saluted her and i said ma'am you know so many cadets and seen that and ready for the class mm-hmm. and i have a question to ask you and she says yeah what do you want to ask me mm-hmm. so, you know this saturday we have this ball and uh, i want you to come with me as my partner Mm-hmm. and this whole class sitting behind me is looking at you know uh looking at me and 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 this 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 young officer is standing <laughs> this woman is standing there and, and, and out of the blue you know i asked her okay would you come for the uh, thing as my partner mm-hmm. and she got shaken up she didn't know what hit her right mm-hmm. uh, and she says uh, oh, no but i i i'm not good at dancing i said i i don't know how to dance at all 
mm-hmm. but can you still come with me as my partner and i persisted it took about 2 minutes the things got tight because she had to start her class i wouldn't let her start class mm-hmm. and and but she said yes so so she was my partner for the ball <laughs> that's that that's one and the second one yeah let's uh, and how old were you about uh, that time 21 21 this is nda no this is i am this is i am okay in, in india what was the success story like for you uh, india was not a success story you know i could it was 3 years but i couldn't really it didn't really have a uh, you know somebody who could come and uh, you know so lots of people are like that there are there are very few really smart guys who you know typically people who studied in pune at some point in time mm-hmm. and you know they would they would have the classmates or college friends or somebody or something mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. but most people were uh, at that time i don't know how things are now with social media and now stuff uh, so might have changed but i'm but my sense is that i think cadets still do not are not allowed to use the the social media that they're, they're not they're not um yeah but a lot of things have changed my nda the last i visited was about 4 years ago there are computers in the cabins uh, i saw a couple of you know we just visited randomly just went into some uh, spot and so there are some some people had phones and they mm-hmm. said oh we need it because we need to communicate and blah 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 and we, we were not very happy about it because we were you know when i went in i was a very senior colonel and uh, you know the guy with me was was even a couple of years senior to me and so we were like aghast what's happened to me <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way things are you know things change yeah That's very fascinating, Ibrahim, and thank you so much for sharing that story. So, after the IMA, what happened? You did so, your yeah. one-year training, and thereafter, yeah. what what all ensued for you? So, so you know, it's like um, you have the counseling session for engineering, where you pick and choose mechanical, milega, civil, milega, wo milega, mm-hmm. and all that. So, in IMA, you have a similar thing to so to to opt for your arm or service, right? You want infantry or artillery or uh, the armored corps or engineers or whatever else. and what they do is they divide this whole batch into blocks of 35 40 and within each block there are vacancies so and they do this because they want all calibers of officers going into all armed forces mm-hmm. otherwise what will happen is the top guys will say i want to go into infantry or armored corps or artillery and all the best guys will go into that arm those arms mm-hmm. and and you know whatever is left over would go to other that's not how they do it so they say even the last block which is in merit it's the last they also get to go into you know these arms and services of choice so so, it, so i opted for artillery and got that went to my regiment which was in, just hold on so uh, i still i'm not still clear how does the oh, allotment take okay. place yeah so so in our batch there were 350 or cadets right mm-hmm. so they said okay break that batch down into 10 blocks of 35 each on merit got so it. the first block is like the top 35 hours in the first and merit block. is based on your performances in oh, the nd and the army and you know physical and studies and the leadership how you've done as a as an appointment and all of the everything and your right? nda ranking has no bearing to it <laughs> no that that's you know so unfortunately in the civil services that's still taken into consideration so when you get into the uh-huh. is uh, your ranks yeah. what whatever rank you got doesn't. yeah here it doesn't yeah. uh, even later on for promotions it doesn't uh, it doesn't count oh. so 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 you know they break it down and they say okay every block of 10% of the batch has a certain number of vacancies of every arm and service so in effect what happens is like you know in our times armored core the tank people are like really high uh, in demand is the most sought after like computer engineering mm-hmm. you know or engineers so so now there are three vacancies in the 35 for engineers right and there are three vacancies also in the last block for engineers so it means that all kinds of officers will go into engineers not just the best officers got it so that's a very very you know in terms of a human resource policy it's I think it's a fantastic policy. Mm-hmm. You don't want all the best guys going into a couple of arms and services, and everybody else left over goes everywhere else. That would be a very skewed kind of an organization where efficiency capabilities will will get concentrated, and the, you know, mm-hmm. it doesn't happen like that. So, what's the incentive to perform really good in the in the IMA? The incentive is you get this uh, your your IC number. You know, in, it's called Indian Commission number IC mm-hmm. number, and it is based on your merit. So the guy who was first in merit has the senior most IC number in my batch, Got and it. this doesn't come into play till you you are reaching that general level, you know, lieutenant general, and where if you are a little older and you're going to retire, right? They will look at your numbers and say, oh, there Got are it. three people from the same batch, so the guy with the IC number gets appointed first. 
He didn't Got get it. promoted, but he gets mm-hmm. appointed first, right? Got uh, it. Because within the same batch, you can't. There's no other differentiation. It's just that number. Hmm. Makes sense. So, uh, what was your IC number? Uh, yeah, I was. I was. I think I was thirty first in my batch of three fifty. So that's fairly wow. That's good. amazing. That. Wow. So you got commissioned. Your parents must be so proud of you. They would have yeah. visited you in all the yeah, ceremonies, yeah. and those are yeah. some lavish ceremonies that, that I at least got a glimpse of on YouTube. What after that? You know, once you're commissioned, what happens thereafter? Yeah. So, so you're 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 the senior most cadet in the organization. You know, in that in the academy, and you you're like a big ego and all of that, and then. somebody pricks you with a pin and it's puts you in a regiment where you, now you're the junior most and you don't know anything that's how things change mm-hmm. right you suddenly become the junior most in a regiment the ceo commanding officer is about 22 years of service mm-hmm. and there are what 10 or 15 officers who got tif, you know thing and experience and all of that and suddenly you land up there as a second lieutenant and you don't know anything at all because ima remember is a generic army training mm-hmm. right It, they don't tell you anything about artillery you don't know anything about artillery it's very different from an infantry battalion mm-hmm. it's very different from an armored you know tank regiment uh, and you get there and then suddenly they're talking a set like talking a different language right they will um uh, you know for instance uh, uh, i don't know if you're aware of this but infantry battalions have their colors right which they take into battle and it's a flag with you know a lot of stuff written there mm-hmm. battle honors and all in artillery you don't have colors the guns are the colors mm-hmm. so every time the gun passes by uh, the there's something called a quarter guard so mm-hmm. quarter guard is where you store all your arms and ammunition and it's a it's kind of a ceremonial place the guard standing there the three four guys they're supposed to come to attention and salute the gun mm-hmm. when it passes by it's because it's a ceremonial it's a color mm-hmm. and they also do that when an officer comes right so it's it's a very different very different culture traditions in an artillery unit and you don't know anything about how artillery works mm-hmm. you land up there and you're a, you're a, you know 22 year old and then you're treated like shit for some time mm-hmm. till you till you understand what's happening uh, and and you know and then you grow right? it takes time and and these officers are like now it is now it is what uh, from 1994 it's it's what 30 30 36 years uh, 26 years um for the 8 years uh, and we're still in touch uh, and we wow. you know i left 8 years ago my first commanding officer is, is you know we're still in touch we talk often his son also commanded the regiment his son was my subordinate you know he was a battery commander he was a major when i was commanding uh, and and so it's just it's just a one big family of you know of some incredible people so uh so ibrahim i heard many terms i heard the term called unit I heard the term called regiment. I heard the term called battalion. What's the difference between all these terms? And uh, for unit is like a yeah, yeah yeah. I mean there are so many terms only right. Unit is a unit is the basic basic structure of the army. So it's a very generic term right. So infantry battalion, artillery regiment, and armored regiment, engineer regiment, ASC battalion. All of these are units. Mm-hmm. And something below that, like a company. Mm-hmm. right an infantry battalion has a has four companies so these are called subunits there is generic term subunit okay right and in artillery you don't have companies you have batteries mm-hmm. uh, in in the tank regiments you know armored corps you don't have batteries or companies you have squadrons uh, so it. so it's, a, it's i mean you can spend the whole day talking about it uh, but a unit is the basic structure the commanding officer is the boss is mm-hmm. and in an art, uh, army unit commanding officer is next to bo- next to god in terms of the powers and the, cap- the you know the hold that he has on mm-hmm. the unit and much of what happens in the you know unit is decided by the commanding officer more than any other policies that can come from anywhere mm-hmm. wow. it's very personal view yeah. so so battalion and regiment it's these are just terms and uh, the meaning would be similar yes got it battalion and uh, infantry regiment in artillery or armored corps uh, you know or engineers they call regiments and stuff like that got it so where was your first posting and uh, and if you were to enumerate and relive that experience what were the three things that you loved about it and three things that you hated about that first first posting yeah yeah oh yeah so so uh, so so i'll just maybe a couple of things you know you treated like shit like i said right it's literally like that and when i landed up there 
after this one month of holiday after i am you know they give you one month off and we land up there uh, so so my immediate senior you know he came as my sahayak you know this whole sahayak thing you would have read in the news right it's a regressive thing from the past and all that but he came as my sahayak to help me pick up my box and you know my suitcase and all that came to the railway station he was my senior he dressed up as a jawan and he came and when we reached uh, and this was near kolkata what three four hours from kolkata so we, we drove from howrah station and you know in our in our truck the second left hand doesn't rate a jeep or the, you know <laughs> the just to, the just to confirm so your senior came as a sahayak yeah he dressed up as sahayak you, you know a lot of like he was not a sahayak on. he was not a sahayak but he okay he was playing the role okay so there's a lot of leg pulling that happens and that's how you create that bond and you know uh, Uh, so incidentally when i was a commanding officer we were in jammu and kashmir we were near shrinagar mm-hmm. so any any guy who would join the regiment second left lieutenants right they would come in so i would get them kidnapped by people dressed as terrorists taken to a apple orchard and threatened mm-hmm. and you know all of that kept in confinement for one day oh, and then at the end of it we would stage a a, a rescue mission mm-hmm. and get him out and then he would come into the mess and we would have a nice party that's how you welcome you know your, your young officers they would this remember is, this is how it should be done <laughs> across yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so so you know i went in and and then they said uh, and typically you know you have this identity card which is very very critical you know you don't want to lose it uh, in the armed forces so they will typically ask for it and they will read and say i'll keep it i need to check up whether it is this is genuine thing or not and then they will not give it back to you and then somebody else will come and say where is your identity card and he says i gave it to so and so and who's that so and so that guy is not around he says you lost your identity card okay we put you in the uh, in the quarter guard which is like there is a small cell for people who are drunk and all that and you know, put mm-hmm. them in there so they put me in there uh, and i'm coming from delhi with overnight journey on a train and then four hours on the truck mm-hmm. and then 12 o'clock they put me in that cell mm-hmm. and in the cell the, the kaidi is not entitled to a mosquito net so in in kolkata west bengal a lot of mosquitoes ponds and so all night i couldn't sleep because there was nothing given to me except a blanket i was sleeping on the floor this is my first day as a second lieutenant in my regiment mm-hmm. okay and and then and, and this carries on i mean it goes on for a month right mm-hmm. all kinds of stuffs the, they take you out of there and then they will people wore somebody else's name plate on the uniform so i said no oh, this is captain dela and so no that's not captain dela that's captain and rahul uh, because they all mixed up the the name plates and i don't mm-hmm. know anyone right mm-hmm. so i'm referring to the wrong guys and all kinds of stuff so it was great it was really nice yeah. in terms of your you know first foray into the real world where you are now a commissioned officer in your first posting what were the three things that you absolutely loved about about that that experience and yeah. uh, three things that you hated about it and was something that you know that you were encountered for the first time and you never imagined that this would happen yeah yeah so yeah what i hated first right so so to 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 make me remember people's names or people mostly officers right there are 15 20 15 officers and you don't know them you look, and you you kind of meet them once in a while because you're busy running here and there and you know you're just doing everything it's like, you're like an intern you know in a company where you ask to do this that whatever you, know. you can't you don't get time to sleep you don't get time to rest and all that so to to help you remember your name they my see immediately you know tell me okay you don't know so and so's name and and their number everybody has an ic number so say oh write it down 500 times so i'm 22 year old guy mm-hmm. and i have to write down his name and number of the commanding officer 500 times and give it by the next morning i mean just very childish right it's like mm-hmm. stupid but but i had to do that i just absolutely hated it but today after 28 years uh, i still remember my first commanding of ic number <laughs> no, ic 33034 <laughs> november that's his ic number i can tell it to him even today oh. i remember my second in command's ic number you know 31867 and he is no more but i still remember his number and my juniors remember my number i remember my immediate senior number you know it's a so it's a what's in a number Mm-hmm. but that's the kind of bond that you build right it's it's uh, you know at the end of the day when 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 any of us is in trouble we don't think twice before going and helping them out it's like it's it's like god's duty to do that mm-hmm. it doesn't come from going for a, a off site in in a pub but that mm-hmm. doesn't come from that right that's the difference wow so the one thing that you hated and loved both was the drills so that I, you went to what i love what i okay. love 
right okay what i love yeah but so this thing i hate writing down names and mm-hmm. this is the most stupid thing that uh, what i love you know my commanding officer he called me you know you are a youngster so this guy says i want you to go to all the battery cook houses cook houses where the jawans have their food right they don't go to the mess they have a cook house where the, their food is cooked and i want to go to all the four batteries and uh, eat food there and rate them which one is the best and which is the worst okay mm-hmm. so 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 i had to do that over a week and i would go and have food in, in the papa cubic home these are the batteries right pqr and, and so on so i went and did that and i had the small little there no excel at that time so the notebook mm-hmm. no note down the score out of 10 and so i did that for a week and i came back he said tell me which is the best and which is the worst mm-hmm. so like a good you know like a good young officer i i said to so this battery is the best and this one is the worst and the worst happened to be my own battery every also goes into you know belongs to us mm-hmm. it happened to be my own battery it was the worst food so i just scored and i said this is the worst so my ceo said look but this is your battery mm-hmm. uh, so i said uh, i didn't think of that you know i just wanted to score the food and i find that the food in my own battery is not the best so he called my my immediate boss was the battery commander mm-hmm. it was was one He was a who's a major he was a very senior major with female so he says look this guy is you know he doesn't have any loyalty towards his battery he's saying his own battery is not the worst food so then i said look uh, no i think i am being loyal because you know just because i said that it is not the best food mm-hmm. something will be done about it mm-hmm. and so then my battery is going to have you know my men are going to have better food so i am more loyal than a guy who says everything is fine mm-hmm. so so he says yeah i didn't look at it that way yeah and i think uh... it's a good strategy also you know so at the end of the day since you belong to that battery uh you will be spending a lot of time with your men over there so it it makes a lot of sense to to work for their improvement in comparison to the others but sounds fascinating and uh, so so you began as second lieutenant and uh, when was that moment across your your journey in the armed forces when you said to yourself that all the effort all the hard work was worth it it is this day i can never and never forget for the rest of my life and it was all the all all worth the effort and elaborate a, b- a bit on that experience as well yeah okay um, that's a tough one but uh, yeah that was really um the day that i finished command of my regiment this was um and at that point i had 19 years of service so you would be a colonel was, and until okay very nice i was a colonel yeah i've yeah. been a colonel for about 3 and 1/2 years and finished command of my regiment i commanded my unit for about 3 years little more than 3 years all that 2 years was in a uh, place called baramula in shinagar and then we did one year in you know moved to jhansi and in there i think that was the moment because you have what 650 men and uh, officers and everybody and you're you're the boss it's like end to end there is nobody who can do anything good or bad to these people no brigadier no general can come and change anything in the regiment unless i as a commanding officer agree to it and i want it that's the kind of uh, absolute power and responsibility that a commanding officer has in the indian army right? and which is the easy part the difficult part is to to command in an operational area without getting any casualties um you know people falling sick and getting hospitalized there people die suicide cases people come under distress and do that um damage to equipment this millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment that's under your charge right all this equipment and vehicles and electronic stuff this is not easy to to handle all of that to do all of that you know and get everyone together i right? keep them together for 3 years and and live with uh, you know uh, With, with with without without casualties without operational losses getting your doing all of the things that you're supposed to do those objectives that you have right mm-hmm. while you know keeping your keeping your so called flock together mm-hmm. that is the that is the success moment because you can always al- also do a lot of stuff you know operations and stuff and you get people getting injured wounded in operations or casualty because of negligence uh you know in that area i remember that every unit other than mine had a suicide case mm-hmm. because of stress there was a unit where people moved in and 
and there was some some men who stepped on a, into a minefield and they blew their legs mm-hmm. off right it's just bad luck it just happened mm-hmm. but for even that not to happen when you're commanding is like you know it's like it's just a combination of luck and a lot mm-hmm. of hard work and i can give you an example right the area of the deploy right um on the base uh you can get lulled into a sense of security and you know there are nothing is happening here right you know, nothing is happening all right so you start you know your guards and the, your your perimeter guards and your your quick reaction teams and they say oh nothing happening all right i used to get after them in the middle of the night mobilize them activate them and they would you know this is look if you lose sleep for 2 hours okay but it's it's very important to for all of us to remain safe and secure we used to do that at random time in the night and day and i i used to be ruthless about it mm-hmm. and uh, people would crib you know say okay so you know nothing's happening here and why are you after us uh, but what happened because of that possibly and this is this is something that i can only only imagine that there are civilians working inside your inside your uh, you know campus Mm-hmm. no contractors local contractors so these people see that look every day there's something happening these guys are these guys are active and alert you can't just get somebody to come in and attack them randomly you mm-hmm. got to buy it if you do it and this, all of this messaging goes back it's, mm-hmm. we have this reality this is a contractor laborer coming in he's going to go and tell people in the village they're going to tell somebody there and mm-hmm. they said don't go there because these guys are alert mm-hmm. and sure enough one year or six months after we left some some other unit came in you know we handed over to them and left that exact same spot was attacked and the left wing colonel and two officers died and all that happened same place different set of people right yeah. after three or four years of nothing happening and everybody is happy and saying oh nothing's happening they get attacked and this is amazing so then it came on news I, w- i will not go specifically into what event that was mm-hmm. but it happened yeah. so there's a lot of hard work involved in the in the back end of it there's a lot of uh, you know persistence and 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 uh, you know the leader has to become unpopular yeah. you can't do things that everybody be happy with but you got to do all of that to make sure that you achieve what you what you're there for that's the difficult part absolutely yeah i think you spoke uh, briefly about the suicide cases as well in the indian armed forces uh how prevalent is that and what are the reasons for it yeah it's it's not an easy topic to uh, to discuss right but but i can only tell you what what to what my belief is um suicide you know when it happens is invariably a uh, a uh, failure of command failure of leadership invariably uh you know you can say that oh you know nowadays society has changed and people go back and uh, you know the world is moving at a different pace they feel uh, left behind unhappy they're not able to take care of their families but these things used to happen 50 years ago as well right there is there are some societal changes you know like earlier there used to be these uh, joint families so soldier coming to join the armed forces would leave behind his family in a in a larger joint family environment where their needs are taken care nowadays you find mostly there you know the wife and the children are living alone in a village or in a small town it's not the the, the whole you know the family it's very different and so there are more stresses and all that all of that being said if a soldier has that stress because of family or because of the work environment or because of you know constantly every night you're sitting in an ambush for 4 hours 5 hours you don't have enough sleep you you're told you can sleep in the daytime but in the daytime you really can't sleep you know in a in a post where you're is doing something somebody is maintaining their weapon cleaning a weapon or somebody is cooking or doing something else. so this, it all builds up and and so the it's a leader's role to really find ways to minimize all of these cumulative stresses and yet get the work done you know you, you, you can't say that oh you know people are stressed so t- tonight we're not laying ambushes you know we're going to let people sleep you can't do that but as a as a leader and officer you have to make sure that these guys who are sitting there are turned over frequently so that it doesn't cum- accumulate you know you move from this stressful place to a less stressful role within the same organization you give them leave every 2 3 months so that they can go home take a break and come back they have a problem at home you don't say oh, no 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 today you know we've got this q4 results we have to we have to achieve the target and so you go after that it's mm-hmm. like you do it in a 
you can't do that if this guy's got a problem you got to find a way to send him home mm-hmm. to take care of his problem yet get your work done through yeah. other means that is what leadership is about if you just simply say that look i'm going to hold uh, ask you to hold on stop everything in your life because i have to achieve my targets mm-hmm. and we'll look after your problem look out for your problem after that is done that's not a leader mm-hmm. neither is the leader who says oh go home that's more important forget about this goals we'll not do it i think uh, that's very well well put ibrahim and um, if we were to delve deeper into the suicide aspects of things uh, are these more prevalent the soldier class even the officers are facing certain challenges that are it's more it, yeah it's more yeah. with the soldier soldiers than I mean, officers though i don't have the numbers and mine is just from what i experienced you know what i've heard of um and it's it's about see normally what happens what i have seen is when when a soldier or somebody doesn't have somebody to talk to and share the problem and nobody's listening that's when this happens and when does when does it happen that nobody's listening when people are too absorbed with the functional aspects of the work and you know they just become indifferent to the relationship right when work, it's it becomes a kind of a transactional thing then then you stop listening to your your team members and then this thing kind of accumulates and it such things happen so as a command, and you know when you're commanding a, a unit this is the this is the job of a commanding officer is is not to make life easy for your people it is to uh make sure that the that while you get your work done while you fulfill your responsibilities all of these things are taken care of so that your team is happy while they're doing the toughest of things mm-hmm. and they do it happily very true i think uh, so a few days ago i was talking to a friend so i came to udaipur and um, a very good friend of mine he's in the indian police services and he is on deputation uh, in the bsf uh, and his command is a commandant over there and while having a chat with him even he spoke at lens about the problems of suicide when in office in an unofficial capacity uh prevalent in the in the in the paramilitary forces of india as well and and his point was that uh, at least in the indian army and the in the indian armed forces they do get credit and recognition for the work that they do i don't know how true is that or how false is that uh but in the paramilitary forces no one is aware of the work that they do the bsf or the crpf or the idbp they are in a way in charge of internal security in the borders whatever work that they do army might inadvertently take the credit how true is that and uh, what is the relationship between the paramilitary forces of india and the armed forces you know it's a, it depends on whom you're asking but uh, in terms of credit right um, you know at least i have my batchmates who are now senior brigadiers they're about to become major generals you know the senior and so i interact with them on a daily basis not that i'm lo- I've lost touch with them and so in the army at least in, in all the time that i served we never were looking for credit in and credit in terms of what in terms of some media news report or we never we never were interested in that in fact we used to discourage that we don't want things to go into the media and that they say oh great well done and fantastic or that you have not done a great job and i i i'll give you an example of how you you know this like a it's like a mind field uh, now this is you know when i was commanding in baramula right next to our unit there was this national hydel power you know establishment on the jhelum river there was a there's a hydel power uh, and uh, the workers there had not been paid their wages or something and they were protesting the local people you know they were all protesting outside the gates and there was this paramilitary that guards all these kind of establishments they were manning and uh, they blocked the road which is the lifeline on that in that area and my convoys were supposed to go in the morning and so there was a there was a problem and so you know my boss incidentally general rawat bipin rawat was my boss at that point um, you know so he conveyed through someone that look there is this problem and you make sure that the convoy goes through so i i set up my people there you know just push the convoy through uh, everything went off in the afternoon you know these these guys got restless and they tried to enter that organized that that establishment to they don't break down the gate or whatever and this the paramilitary they opened fire one guy died one civilian you know he died because their job is to protect that establishment there is a crowd trying to mob trying to get inside and they open fire 
and then the news started coming you know that this particular area the army has fired and the somebody civilian has died all right and now i am the guy who is responsible for the military security of that area the military part of it not the other part, right and then we start getting calls what happened what's what's the thing what's happening and what's the update and i said i told my boss look uh, my job is not to go into that area of national highland power right my job is to secure the military establishment i am securing that right i will not go into that area and look at what is happening because that's not my mandate if the firing is taking place something has happened please ask them because as far as i am suppo- what i'm supposed to do i'm doing it my troops are fine we have not fired on anyone we're not engaging with the civilians and that is the day when the chief minister flew down in a helicopter and this, this was a big thing it came on national tv and all of that happening and fortunately for me i had a guy with a video camera standing nearby you know and and recording the whole thing and so when people got agitated you know up the chain till army headquarters you know, oh no what the hell is happening you know this i sent this video across and it was very clear that look it's not us uh, that's that's involved in it so you have to be with the media we don't want to get involved in you know taking credit it's the army doesn't work that way we don't want to what you see nowadays on tv and you know the so called news channels is mm-hmm. is is not something that the army wants to promote they don't want to get involved in it if mm-hmm. somebody had a fight in doklam or somewhere else the army definitely does not want to put that video on on tv mm-hmm. doesn't want to right and and in one of the exercises you know this is maybe if we have the time we we had a huge exercise when i was in another role i was heading operations for a division after i finished command mm-hmm. and in this this whole exercise one of the generals came from the command headquarters and you were having these it's like a brainstorming situation and you know you know what will you do with that and then as a head of operations for the division division mm-hmm. is about 17000 men right so he has this hypothetical question that war is broken out and there is this particular area which is uh, you know which is a little low profile but sensitive and mm-hmm. the enemy has come in and captured it and then barkha that and the tv people have, are putting that we india has lost the battle and all that what will you do mm-hmm. right what you what you do so the answer that i gave was this right that look news channels can keep saying anything our our tactical and operational plans do not change because news channel is saying something right right it yeah. is not driven by news it is driven by our strategic goal and plan and we will continue to do if at that point in time our operational plan is to let go of that piece of you know thing we will let go of it and we will get it back at the op- uh, correct moment we are not going to panic and say oh news channels are saying this so let's put everything there we don't want to do that so so the army doesn't want to go into taking credit and as i can say if, as mm-hmm. as a veteran and i'm sure you ask any general in say the same thing absolutely and i think uh, a point about the news channels i think someone was telling me the news channels are actually the views channels so in whatever way they can get their views that's the news they always uh, take it with a huge huge grain of salt especially in the us and india that's beautifully put ibrahim and other thing with the and this is now we're taking a detour from the life in the army to about the pop culture so i think there was a study conducted by isp hyderabad a few years ago that there was a, some correlation you know whenever a movie is released could be border could be laksha you see a lot many applications in for the in indian armed forces something similar happened when stanford did the same when the top gun was released in the us a rec- record number of uh, enlistments uh, in the air force and the navy and incidentally for for me and people of my generation the real top gun is that one not this one i would conquer <laughs> and still you choose the army not the naval aviation <laughs> so because that's because yeah. if i may add that's because at that time there was another movie called platoon mm-hmm. that's the one that we saw all right platoon that was in vietnam right okay um fair enough so uh, the the question is uh, pop culture pop culture definitely has a lot of influence uh, in the decisions that youngsters make especially at a very young age but the real life could be a lot different from the real life not shown in the movies based on your observations based on your experiences what are those uh, you know what what could be dark sides of being in the armed forces if there are any dark sides um that that the, 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 the reels may not cover question a bit the question Absolutely. is simple you know so for example so for example uh, the real life is a lot different from the real life that's usually shown in the movies 
and the pop culture that might inspire people to join the armed forces rightfully so so in terms of your experiences and observations um what could be the stark differences between the real life that's shown in the movies versus the real life that's actually there in the armed forces yeah um it's like it's like everything else in this world right um when when people talk about apple and the iphone they say oh great it's a fantastic thing but does anyone talk about all of those engineers who spent hours and hours and days of working and trying to design that thing which ultimately came out and then it took 5 years to to really catch on right that would make a very boring movie right if somebody makes a movie about hours of work that those engineers and people of designers have done but but everybody will make a movie about steve jobs yeah and the the movies you know about the armed forces are like that right uh, if you make a movie about this guy sitting in in a in a on the line of control and day in and day out is going every night is going to an ambush he's going for a patrol and he comes back and eats this sukha roti and some dal and you make a movie about that nobody's going to like it mm-hmm. nobody's going to join the join the army right and i would say that you know off off the cuff 90% of the work that the army does is very very unglamorous it's very very it can be very very boring and it can be very very painful right Uh, it will not attract people and rightly so right i mean if you want to become an officer you have to go through 3 4 years of training which is really really you got to get up at 4:30 in the morning i tell me how many people who are 19 years old today will get up willingly and go and do 2 hours of physical training and then go and sit through 6 hours of classes where they have to study college level mathematics and and physics uh it, not many that's a boring part it's dis- it's like it's like very uh, very difficult to do but everybody would like to wear a nice set of medals on their chest you know and wear a very nice uniform mm-hmm. and 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 stand and be uh, felicitated by a lot of people right uh so so the, the grunt work that that people do uh and most of the people do it on a on a daily basis it's it's not appreciated so the movies that come out and they say this guy is really brave for every brave guy who gets a medal there are 200 others who are equally or possibly more brave who don't get it they are not recognized but they continue to do it not because you know this like oh it's so disgusting i'm not it because it does the thought doesn't cross their mind it's mm-hmm. that their work they do it um so uh, Uh, you know and, and and as officers this i get this a lot right mm-hmm. uh, because i've made this transition uh, people say oh you know in the army it must have been so easy for you just pass an order and it gets done as if we are some slave dri- drivers and you know you just there's a bunch of slaves they will do whatever you tell them to do that's it's not like that you have to motivate people to do things that are boring which are tiring uh, you know you got to keep doing it every day uh, Uh, because if you don't do it you will find those really glamorous things happening mm-hmm. you know attacks and people dying and then there's somebody coming and doing that brave thing so to avoid that you have to do the unglamorous and the, 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 the you know the hard work and and that is the difficult part which which you have to continue doing and and so uh, these awards medals are sort of uh, you know they are there they, they they have to be there because they motivate people to try and do such similar things to join the organization mm-hmm. uh but it does not mean that all of those other people the, the 99% of people who don't get awards are not they they, mm-hmm. they don't similar things which is the something get picked up and highlighted great so let's assume that i am currently an undergrad at iit delhi or st stephens anywhere in in a good university in india and i am flirting with the idea of joining the armed forces I see CDS as one option. I see various other postings by the Navy and the Air Force, so on and so forth. What advice would you have for them, for those youngsters who are currently, you know, they have already gone through the undergrad degree and now flirting with the idea of joining the armed forces? What three, four advices that you would have for them that could make their decision much easier? That this should be the right career for me, or uh, for these many reasons, and this is the career that I should not be opting for for these many reasons. Um. So the advice that I would give them is one: if you're looking for uh, a life that's comfortable, 
comfortable in the sense that you know you've got a great salary and you live in great cities and you have access to social media all the time this is not the place for you it's not the place uh, if you if you're looking for um something that you know excites you you're willing to give up your comfort to get that um that excitement or the thrill of doing something different you know include and that different includes leading people in the real sense not leading them from 9 to 5 and then you know going to a pub later on and calling it uh, leadership and and uh, no in the real sense uh, and you're willing to give up your comfort and the comfort is that you will not be living in mumbai or bangalore or delhi you know you'll be living in a small place uh, you will may, may not get sleep in the you know in the uh, you may not have a very comfortable bed folks for the navy would be different navy folks stay it's living just, it's in it's the same it's the same believe me <laughs> no they live in big good cities but you know you're out on the sea life is terrible on the ship life is not comfortable it 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 looks great because the people are on the bridge and they're talking to you know there's a video camera but this you should go and see how they sleep how they eat how they uh, you know it's it's not it's not good it's difficult uh and the same thing in a air force you know it's, it's the same thing but the kind of experiences that you get from there is, are those that you can apply for the rest of your life you and and you know somebody says i want to experiment right go in for short service commission go for 10 years come out you'll be a better person whether you're a man or a woman you'll be a better person because of the kind of things that you're exposed to uh mm-hmm. you want the law you're in for the longer run do it for 20 years and come out you want to mm-hmm. stay there stay there till you retire you know ready to drop that's fine uh but there are options where you can really say oh i've had enough of this and i want to come out and do something else when you come out what you learnt in the armed forces will always hold you in good stead right mm-hmm. uh, provided the basic thing remains that you are willing to 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 let go of your comfort and relearn some things and come out and do it right if you say no i have whatever i learnt i am in my comfort zone and i am good with what you what i've learnt in the forces and i'm going to stick with that mm-hmm. maybe that's that's not the best strategy to follow right but the armed forces are the place if you want to really go and in you know engage with other people if you're a people person great place to go mm-hmm. and i i let me give you an example right as as a commanding officer i used to interview a lot of soldiers who come in going for leave or something else i talked to a soldier young guy 21 years old or maybe 20 years old soldier his family in andhra pradesh mm-hmm. he had a small plot of land half an acre their annual income for the family was 1 lakh rupees annual income okay so can you imagine interacting with any such kind of person if you're working in any kind of tech company and you know and and you 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 come from a city okay and mm-hmm. you're educated your family is educated some people are abroad and you interact with this person as how do you manage with 1 lakh rupees and there are three people in his family you know his father mother his younger brother and he's there mm-hmm. and he says that when he joined the army as a recruit his family income has multiplied 3x mm-hmm. right and he's a soldier he's a recruit the mm-hmm. bottom of the heap mm-hmm. and and so most of the people in the forces are like that they come from rural areas really tough background they're working they come into this forces the life has changed their status in the villages has changed because of they joined the forces and not just because of the army or armed forces because of the money that they're getting mm-hmm. and their their families have transformed and you're part of that journey right you mm-hmm. you you as a leader you are interacting with them helping them to get there you're getting you're, you're trying to help them get the children to study more their wives to become you know start working yeah. it's not just about holding a rifle and sitting in a trench right uh, so so those are the kind of experiences that make you realize what this country is and what you should be doing so oh, it's a good advice and and rightfully so and and more so from a person like you who has also transitioned into the world of private sector very successfully so you have built and seen both the sides of the story and we're giving this advice based on your observations from across the from across experiences which rarely happens so there are many many even in ggi we are attracting many young officers who just got retired from the armed forces and uh, they go through the training in the ggi and they are able to pivot into various sectors of their choice but coming to think of it my sense is and i could be totally wrong and i hope i am wrong that uh, the experiences that you have in the private sector for the first 10 15 years 
thereafter and depends upon which private sector are you in i mean are you in the lower rung or are you, are you in the high end consulting mckinsey or are you in the un so on and so forth for the ssc it's little difficult to to pivot into the world of private sector so what would be your advice to those young officers who just come who just completed their services learned enormous skill sets across disciplines how can they now transition back into the world of private sector uh, so so you you're referring specifically to the short service commission you know, those who are in the early 30s mid 30s right the early 30s could be from short service yeah. commission could be could yeah. be the permanent commission folks who thought yeah. you know yeah uh, who leave come out yeah. yeah for various reasons yeah and i talked to a lot of them um and uh, you know you you've seen i also go and i spoke to the there's a there's a batch of officers doing the six month program in iim bangalore i spoke to them uh and you see i believe uh, that if you look you know if as a as a young officer is coming out if you're looking for a career right there are, there are two types of thing one is you're looking for a job and you want a job and you want to start working and be done with it if you're looking for a career and i believe that all of these young officers who come out should be looking for a career because you're 30 35 years old you've got 30 years more of your working life left look for a career whether it's a and and i don't want to restrict it to the private sector it could be a private sector you want to teach and you know you want to become a lawyer you want to become a social activist you have the peak of your life working life still in front of you uh, and what the armed forces have given you is um, the ability to manage uh, stress uh, the ability to man- to deal with people you know all kinds of people and this is something that we have to realize that in any given team you cannot have everybody being excellent and everybody being poor you no know, you have all kinds of people the good leaders really take whatever they get and build that into a great team and that's what you learn in the armed forces so this is a great experience but to really start your second career you cannot just rest on your laurels and say oh, i know how to deal with i know all of this no you got to get back into learning the basics of the chosen field that you you're going to if you want to be a lawyer and you've done your llb before you joined the armed forces it's already gone it's dead you got to do something else you know whether it is learning something on intellectual property or something else you want to go into business management i say look go and do a mba from the best place or do something like what you've done in ggi right learn those basics because if you don't know what a balance sheet is or a profit and loss statement is how will you go and manage a business you can't you can't do that and to to be able to understand it you have to you have to go through the rigor of studying it in an academic environment or in an environment where your peers have that knowledge and you're able to share it with you meaningfully right uh, and so my advice is whatever you whatever you want to go into go, take a step back and and go back to the basics learn the basics and then then it it's it it doesn't ease your struggle the struggle still remains there are biases in the environment about armed forces there are biases about age um you know there are biases about which part of the world you come from those are realities you cannot say that no no those are unfair and we need to stop those things they will remain you, the idea is how can you manage those biases yeah right if somebody says you know that uh, you're too old to do this uh, all right show something that that tells that person that look you know even though you're old you just still young at heart <laughs> Right. Or you say you're, 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 you're rigid. Anyway. I get this a lot. Right? That you're you're from the armed forces. You're very rigid. Uh, show them how you're flexible. I think even being rigid is good sometimes, and uh, more so it's folks not, from yeah, the armed it's forces. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. More so folks from the armed forces. They really get old. Uh, the kind of drills that you've gone through and the fitness that you maintain. Um, that's that's really remarkable. For you, when you decided to move ahead and. on your uniform you chose the fletcher school of law and diplomacy how did that decision come into picture you learned the law you learned the business you learned artificial intelligence you learned a lot of things during your journey to fletcher school but before fletcher you know how did you take that decision why did you choose fletcher school of law and diplomacy yes so it was i would say it was uh, uh, i would um, it was an accident really um, and i'm going to be very very fair about right i mean Uh, it was a planned move i wanted to go into business management and i said look if i'm going there i want to go and do the best i and fletcher was not on my horizon not for any other reason i didn't know about it i just didn't know about it uh, 
So I said, okay, I I, I want to so when you start thinking as a Harvard, Wharton, uh, you know, uh, Stanford, I would go there. Right, all of that. Right, that's what get me environment. And so then I started doing research on it, and then I found if you're on the wrong side of forty, these these people are not going to even consider you uh, unless you're that exceptional, and you know you don't. And I'm not that exceptional. I'm just an ordinary guy. So so you know, I narrowed down things, and I did my GRE, GMAT exam, and then you get a score. You got to be real, right? For the score that you get, how many times are you going to attempt it again and again? What is the score that you really want? To and now I'm mentoring officers who are coming out. and uh, you know i this is what i tell them it look you, you, you want to get that 800 score on gmat and take 20 years to do it that's not going to solve your problems and you got to come to a realistic thing and go with it you got to go with a real thing right and you got to make those those choices and you got to make those compromises between the score that you want the school that you want uh, the place that you want to go to the amount of money that you've got your mm-hmm. family situation you got to you got to take all of these together and then make your decision yeah so so i applied to uh, you know i got a certain score and based on those scores i applied to three or four places within that score below that score and above that score and mm-hmm. all that strategy I applied and i got into usc marshall mm-hmm. or their M- mba program they gave me a nice scholarship i paid their fees and then i was talking to somebody who lives in boston you know who through an acquaintance and he said oh you're coming to the us have you applied to the fletcher school with your background that's a place you should be going to military mm-hmm. and you know this is a place where you can learn much more than just business management you know that you can understand the political environment the economic environment why businesses do things that they do in different parts of the world uh, why governments do thing for create policies yeah. in the so this whole you know thing so i said oh wow well, i don't know this place uh, so i googled and i found this place and i found oh the admission is still open and this was in i think december january sometime right and i'm already in usc marshall mm-hmm. right everything done i said what the hell 80 dollars application i'm going to apply <laughs> <laughs> so i applied and and they they said we want to talk to you we have this conversation they said we give you an admission they give me the same scholarship that the other school is giving mm-hmm. okay and this is where negotiation comes in and this is before i did that negotiation for the pletcher uh and i as google there said what do i do i have got the same scholarship mm-hmm. but i want to go to boston this seems like a better place to go and you know mm-hmm. better aligned with what i want to do so they said ask for it you ask for it if you don't ask for it you'll not get it right so i said you know i said look okay, i already got this scholarship which is the same thing that you're giving me mm-hmm. why should i come to you Absolutely. and they said okay we'll yeah. do something better and they gave me something better <laughs> you know it was a very nice scholarship and i liked the place and i liked you know like the, the course and program and all and that. the boston matter and then the boston matter <laughs> and i joined yeah that's how it went and of course, see at the back of it it's not mm-hmm. as simple as that with the back of it even with that scholarship there's a lot of money involved and i was i was lucky because when i left the army you know they give you all of your benefits and stuff and so i said i'll invest that in, in in my education and a lot of people tell me that uh, ask me that one why are you doing that you know buy a flat there in jaipur and that will appreciate so much you're spending so much money in the us and what do you get for it mm-hmm. let's look if i wanted to buy a plot i would have become a property dealer <laughs> you know I, i didn't want to do that i want to and it's not just about me you know, my family went mm-hmm. with me you know my daughter was in high school in boston she exposure that she got she got there yeah. uh, you know good or bad you know it's an exposure it's an experience mm-hmm. uh, so all of that was important right well said i think the investments is not just about again buying property it's it's the yeah. entire journey of experience the skills that you gather and all the stories you that you so many people, the right? that I mean, you make yeah if i not gone i wouldn't have met you and we wouldn't be talking right now <laughs> very true and i'm so glad that that happened and uh, i'm also delighted that you went to the fetcher school of law and diplomacy and for all those uh, his little plug about gji so gji has formed a formal collaboration with the fletcher school of law and diplomacy so if you're a fletcher gji scholar you are guaranteed 20000 dollars scholarship minimum for the two years and you may not also have to pay for the for the application fee the 80 dollars that uh, ibrahim spoke enough and uh, it's a phenomenal school based in boston and uh, we both had a, an incredible time over there yeah so that's a, a very interesting story ibrahim so if we talk more about uh, your experiences at fletcher school of law and diplomacy how were those experiences different from 
the ones that you had when you were studying at the NDA and the IMA. Of course, now you had many folks from the diplomacy to the background in private equity to now yeah. folks from various other armed forces. But uh, what were the, those two, three stark differences that you that you saw? So, so one was, you know, the, in the uh, the MIV program has this uh, strategy capsule, right, where we come in 15 days earlier than the rest of the, uh, you know, thing before the semester starts. So there we have a different bond. MIV, MIV people have a different bond because of the 15 days that we spend doing the strategy capsule. And so the first day itself, you know, we were all introducing ourselves, and I, I realized that I was probably the oldest guy, except for uh, dean of the program, Baskar. Uh, and I got up and said that I was 43 at that point in time, and I think the the next oldest was 30 or 31, possibly. Uh, so, so, so you know, my classmates and peers with whom I would, was interacting over those two years were all at least 15 years younger, and from a different, entirely different kind of a culture, part of the world, uh, you know. And, and so, it was great. It, it was not easy. I'm not saying it was easy. Because you come from a very structured organization where you're, you know, over, over a period of time, you become very senior and everybody addresses you with a lot of reverence, um, you know, and, and, you know, in my office, the, I used to get tea, a waiter with white gloves used to come and get me tea in my office in the army, right, the last job. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you are in this classroom with you know, a bunch of people sitting and, you know, uh, so, so, but it, it, I think it was required because, you know, it helped me get back in touch with the real people who are, who are making changes in the world. Otherwise, you're like, you know, outdated and stuff. So, uh, so it was great because you get so many perspectives. You understand what people are thinking in other parts of the world. Uh, you know, and and you have you, you know, you have this problem that's given to you in a class, and you look at it a certain way, and then you find that the person sitting next to you has looked at it totally differently. Just, yeah. just. There is nothing common, and that's the amazing part of the Fletcher, right? Mm -hmm. It just gets you into that uh, thing. And and I wouldn't say that being older was a was a disadvantage. I think it was it was really great because uh, good or bad, you know, you have good, you feel good about certain things. You really don't like some of the things that are happening, but that's that all of that adds to your experience. In, in, in reality, everything is not going to be good for you. Mm -hmm. And and that helps you to get over that whole transition business, and it helped me. That's part of the transition. You, you, you experience things that you don't like in a very safe environment. University is a very safe environment. Yeah. Right? You experience those and you make the, whatever you take back with you. And then when you go into the real world and you experience similar things, you know that, okay, this is not the end of the world. This is fine. Mm -hmm. this, this is how it happens. It's okay. Very true. So now after Fletcher, you pivoted into the world of private sector. How was that pivot like? How easy or difficult was that journey? It and how did you easy. maneuver it? Uh, it was not easy. Um, in fact, when we were all looking for internships after the first uh, year, you know, um, I, I, that was around the same time that the movie Intern came in. You know, 60 year old guy going looking for an internship. And I said, yeah, much better than him because I'm only 44. <laughs> and, and I was looking for an internship. And then, you know, again, I had my army Indian network. Um, there was a senior of mine who has a great consulting firm running in San Francisco and I was in touch with him. He, was my he connected me with somebody in in uh, Verizon and they, two, three days before the semester was to end, everybody's talking about what this internship and that I have nothing because nobody wants an old guy for an intern. Right? And I was getting a little worried and I said, well, I don't want to go back to India to save money on the three months. That's the most stupid thing I can do, right? I want experience. Uh, uh, after coming here, I don't want to go back to and spend those things, right? So, so I get this call from Verizon, and they say, "Well, we have this role for you." And because I had uh, run operations in a stadium, and this was this setting up some technology stack in in stadiums, you know, baseball stadiums and stuff like that, and it looked interesting. And so I had this conversation, and they said, "When can it can you join on Monday?" And all that. No, no, no. I said, wait, hang on. I want to understand what the work is, what it is, and what kind of compensation you're going to give me and stuff like that. So they quoted a compensation, which is like an undergrad compensation, right? It was like very, I said, look, the compensation indicates to me that this work is not going to add any value to, to, to what I'm looking for, right? It's, it doesn't look, you know, it looks like something where I would be doing really, you know, after 20 years of, uh, you know, experience doing a lot of stuff, this wouldn't 
the composition doesn't indicate uh, anything good and i refused it and this contact to mind sitting in time uh, like you got two more days to go and you're refusing this you got nothing else mm-hmm. happening and so i i said no but i'm very clear that i don't want to go and do something which is meaningless you know and the indicator is the compensation that i had a very good idea about that and i, I think later on i realized it was true mm-hmm. and then i said oh, i have not got nothing now i got to do something mm-hmm. and i went back home and i i pulled out this list of startups in boston found their contact me id uh, email ids mm-hmm. and i wrote a mail which had nothing in the subject matter in the in the in the sub uh, sorry in the in the body of the mail it says headline subject matter said you know i can work for you i'm an i'm a veteran with 20 years of operations experience mm-hmm. and i can work for you for free because i said at this point i said i don't want if if i get compensation it's going to be what i deserve if i'm not getting it i want experience Yeah. but i'm definitely not going to go and work where it's like you know so i put in this this send this mail to 15 startups two of them responded okay and i just had my resume and this subject line mm-hmm. and two of them responded and this is guy len uh where i i joined them so this is it, your resume is amazing and but i don't know why you want to you know why you want to do this So I told him, look, I want experience. I don't have experience in a private, you know, company, and mm-hmm. you know, I, I want to work. I'm not looking for money. You don't want to give me money. That's fine. Mm-hmm. I, I can work for three months. I want to be, you know, doing this. He said, okay, how do we do this? I said, where is your office in Cambridge? Okay, Monday morning, 8 a.m. I'll be there. Look, sounds good. This is on Friday evening. Um, so Monday morning, and uh, I went there. and so len was opening the door you know it's a small startup four people uh, in analytics and uh, healthcare analytics and I went in and and he says uh, tell me what do you know about healthcare in the us i said that's a thing i don't nothing mm-hmm. but this is the advantage you have when you say that look i don't expect anything from you right mm-hmm. and i'm there i can do whatever you want so he says okay uh, so could you try and understand something more and we can talk on wednesday and you know about that and i So, okay fine so two days i went back and researched healthcare in the us in and out and on wednesday morning i had a two hour briefing with him and i explained to him about medicare and medicaid medicaid and you know the whole thing and and i still have an image of that chart that i, uh, that I made on the whiteboard uh, and the end of it he says look today i have learned more about healthcare in the us than i knew and he was a he had been a professor of medical uh, you know technology in howard medical school before that he just today i learned so many things about healthcare policies and stuff that i did not know uh, and he says let's do it on friday he says we want to start paying you this is wednesday friday he says we want to start paying you mm-hmm. but by the time i had i can't know that fletcher has this whole one you know summer uh, Yeah, intern. You know, they they pay you some money, right? If you don't have a paid internship, so they had this thing. So somebody oh. told me for it, and I signed up for it. Mm-hmm. On Friday, when he says I want to start paying you, I said, look, I can't take money from you now because I have already signed up for that, mm-hmm. and that's for two months. At the end of two months, we'll talk compensation. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a very yeah. so, interesting story. I wasn't aware of uh, of. how you navigated your internship and this is really wonderful now go on and i can tell you that at the end of two months they gave me the the median plus compensation for mba interns in boston area which includes harvard and mit stone okay i was oh. possibly one of the highest paid interns in that year for all the right reasons <laughs> and i worked with them for about 7 months afterwards oh that's that's wonderful now uh, so very very fascinating ibrahim about your career in the armed forces about your journey in the private sector the wonderful pivot that you made uh, and of course you're doing wonderful work currently in the banking of india any key learnings that you are leveraging in your current role that you had learned in the armed forces and your time in boston yes um so i think separately right what i learned in the armed forces and what i learned in, in, in but the formal education so our forces um, you know i think whenever whenever we went into a new posting new role right every three years you go into a new role in the army you start from scratch you go right into the trenches and start learning from there um, 
and then you do it over a very short period of time you know two, two months one month two months um, for instance in the army you know i i'm an artillery officer but i uh, you know i did the staff college in, in this the program in wellington for one year and after that they decided they said that oh yeah, this guy can can do this you know going to another role and they put me as the uh, operations officer of an armored brigade the tanks right so an artillery officer going into an armored brigade as operations very very rare mm-hmm. and when i went in i have never i never sat in a tank but now i'm supposed to run operations for these three regiments plus of tanks mm-hmm. and report to my boss who's a brigadier And these are two levels, three levels up from what I was doing in a in a totally new environment. So learn, go back to the, go into the basics, learn that. The same thing is what I I carried forward. You know, when I went to Mutur, where which is an NBFC, mm-hmm. I spent the first three months going to branches and sitting. I've actually disbursed go loans on the system. You know, for the customers. Yeah, taking the loan, appra- gold, appraising it, you know, doing all the scratch test and this test and that test, and then saying, "Oh, this gold is worth so much," and then doing the loan, you know, documentation. All I've actually done that, talking to the customers to understand why they come in, what do they want, stuff like that. And that is, I think, that that basics, you know, whatever level you go to, you become a CEO. You have to. It's a new business, and you you have to go and do that. Without that, you just have the superficial knowledge. that you get from reports that people give and reports are always colored by uh, interests mm-hmm. right so if you're if you're if a vice president of operations is giving you a report that you know this is happening that there is his interest and his his year end appraisal and stuff like that mm-hmm. in his mind when he gives you the report right so unless you go and understand the real ground situation uh, you know you, you don't really know what's happening and and there are any number of people who will tell you this um, what i learned in in fletcher mm-hmm. right uh basic stuff and that was the reason why i went to fletcher you understand the basics of business management you know that finance class professor jack uh it, it's a, it's a thing right that you got to do it and that's the only finance course that i did and then every year i have i don't know why people course. had such such uh, i mean i thought it was very, was, was an easy class uh, and he taught it really well but there was a oh, okay. lot of few inquire about that class for some reason but yeah go on <laughs> it was very very intense uh, and every week you get those uh, assignments which are very painful to complete i completed all of them um, i got an a on that course by the way uh, you know i'm i'm very still very 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 happy about that particular course and getting an a on jacks class because i was totally raw on finance but that course and then there is a there is a very small book on on business finance corporate finance that i have on my on my kindle and my ipad i read it every year to to refresh the basics of finance is it valuations mckinsey one um, no i you know often okay. i don't remember the name but i read i read it once every year it's what you know balance sheets and profit and loss and and you know all of that stuff you just go through all of those things and how it comes builds into defining what a company like and that is helping me even now uh, uh in let's say in in mutur you know one of the things that i was doing identify the 3600 branches and identifying branches that are not profitable and what to do with them right mm-hmm. and in a in a lending company it's not just about a, a branch that makes losses but you also have to look at the asset under management yeah. because if you close down branches that have a lot of asset under management your the valuation of the company go down so you want to also look at com- branches that are smaller in terms of asset under management and making losses so it's not a very simple you know way to i so i worked on those kind of things really all thanks to this this finance course mm-hmm. uh, right and other thing like negotiation is is i think another thing is really amazing mm-hmm. um practical negotiation uh even while doing a job you know where when you change jobs and you're negotiating compensation mm-hmm. in fact that's another another talk that i give to these veterans who transitioning about uh salary negotiation which i did very very recently with this iim uh, folks as well uh and it it it's the basics but it opens your eyes to so many possibilities right and, and that those kind of things are Absolutely. really important Fantastic. Uh, so let's assume now people are inspired to join the armed forces after your incredible journey. They see you. You get to do so many things. You get to live so many lives along along in in your forty to fifty years of 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 life cycle. Let's do an opposite question. So you pivoted from the armed forces to the world of the civilian journey, where you are performing really well. 
So what if uh, someone from the private sector wants to join the armed forces? That person wants to do it, not go in full throttle. Based yeah. on my understanding, there's something called the territorial army. What is that? And how can folks who are already working in certain jobs can somehow contribute and be part of the amazing um, lifestyle of the Indian armed forces? Yeah, that's, a, that's great. That's another great option for people. You know, it's like every year you have to commit to doing some four weeks or something of service uh, if you join the territorial army and uh, you are exposed to that kind of a uh, that kind of an organization you actually go and deploy and do things it's not like you know that you do four weeks of some uh, simulated stuff you there are territorial armies you that are deployed in uh, uh, maybe not the frontline operations but supporting operations which are in themselves a great exposure and it's a, it's a great uh, it's a great experience because you know, you are in an environment where you do things and you're exposed to certain things that are ongoing and they will continue for the rest of your life. But you come out and you uh, you go into another organization where you see things happening in a totally different way. The priorities are very different. In, in the armed forces, you know, this is, this is the biggest, starkest contrast is that in the, uh, and, and this, is, this is the lesson that I take, in the armed forces, the the goal and the objective is the overriding factor in any decision taken or anything that's done. In a private sector, the overriding factor is end of the day is profit, right? You will, whatever you do or not do, end of the day, your goal is to get that profit, whether it's quarterly or annual or, you know, uh, even for startups that are looking at growth, one day they want to look for profit, otherwise it's going to close down. You can keep talking about valuation and stuff, but without profit at the end of the, you know, think in the armed forces, it is goal. So to achieve that goal, you can, you can compromise on people. And that is in terms of life and death, mm -hmm. you can compromise on uh, cost. You can, it's okay to get your equipment damaged, destroyed, right? You can compromise or not on time, right? Mm -hmm. You may want something immediately or some things in just like, okay, you know, just doesn't matter. Uh, so, so, you know, the priorities in the armed forces are very, very different. And it'll, you see business in the armed forces are not very different. It's just a matter of what is your priority at what point in time and space. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it that way, it doesn't, it's not very difficult to transition from one to the other, whether you're going from business to uh, the private sector or vice versa, uh, to the military or vice versa, right? For example, and this like competition, right? Uh, porters, five forces. You can apply them in the armed forces in, mm -hmm. while, while deciding your strategy. You can apply your 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 strategic operational you know uh, uh, models in the business. And mm -hmm. and when you really look at it, your competitor is like the enemy in the armed forces, right? What is the, you always want to know what the enemy is doing and be one step ahead of him or her. In private sector, in the business, you always want to be one step ahead of your competitor. Mm -hmm. You always want to be very close to your customers. That's the reason why I say, if you're a CEO, you have to go and sit in the branch and talk to the customer and the staff because they are the ones who are actually giving you the getting you the revenue. You mm -hmm. have to, and in the armed forces, you say never lose contact with the enemy, right? So, so there are a lot of things like this which are like absolute transferable knowledge and skills mm -hmm. and capabilities which most people don't probably look at it that way and in that's fact, why they uh, struggle very very well said. we are currently st speaking with uh, a few professors at Tuck and wharton and even at fletcher in designing a, a course on military strategy and how it boils down to the world of private sector for the gji and uh, one thing although we haven't formally launched it and uh, but you all have the first glimpse of it but what we realized based on our research is that in the world of private sector so in the army in the military you know there is a zero-sum game there's going to be a winner there's going to be a loser but when we look at the private sector that's not the case yes it, it is a, it is a scale right it's a scale of success or failure so it is where you want to hit that scale mm -hmm. so that's very fascinating but yeah so in terms of going back to the territorial army how can so what's what are the career prospects for someone who joins the TA? So it's, a, it's, look, it's similar to the regular army, you know, you, up to left colonel, it's, uh, it's time scale, right? I think nowadays two years, you become a captain and in six years, with six years of service, you become a major, 13 years, you become a left colonel, right? It's time scale. It just goes on. Beyond that, to selection to colonel, 
is based on us on your performance during these years and they look at all of that and there's a selection board um and and you know you get picked up to be that rank and beyond right so if you are a you know you're a territorial army uh, member you can go up to colonel in this uh, in this way and it's great because you know it gives you the optimal kind of a mix between the military life and your your other your, your real life right uh, and while you're doing this you're covered it's not like uh, you know you get hurt or something happens to you you're not taken care of all that is covered those you know those legal aspects and those financial aspects they're all taken care of uh, otherwise it's it's just not um, attractive right so yeah and what if you know uh, someone joins the ta so someone is working with any organization and decides to join the ta after 3 years he or she realizes that i'm not meant for it and i would want leave. to leave absolutely yeah it's not a it's ta is not a full time commitment with a bond mm-hmm. and stuff like that you know you can you can always leave and the thing with ta is you can join only if your organization has signed up for it i think there's something like that there's a clause mm-hmm. like that so your organization has signed up that our my employees can be ta also because you know the organi- the company has to commit to relieving those people for that two weeks six weeks or whatever in a year so uh, oh, it's just six so weeks then. in the entire year that the ta has to it's, it's something like that it's there's a period right it's two months or something i'm, I'm forgetting the exact number mm-hmm. but it's something like two months a year they have to serve during which time they cannot go back and do their deployment and so the company that signs up for it has to you know they have to agree to this because their employees are going to be away for two months and for the two right. months when the employees are away who pays for the salary is it going to be the army the or the ta will the ta will pay for the salary they do pay for the salary and the organization yeah. does not have to they, they don't have to and i don't know how how it depends i think it depends from organization to organization right so uh oh, makes a lot of makes a lot of sense and it sounds very very exciting i think i don't know about other other organizations but at least in the ias i know of a friend who joined the ta despite being in the ias and his experience has been phenomenal so far in um, serving in the in the armed forces now you know why the difference yeah. the, and and i like to put that in here in 2007 there was this gujjar agitation in rajasthan right they for reservation mm-hmm. uh in jaipur they blocked the rail and all that so and i was one of the military army columns that was deployed there because the civil administration could not manage and you know there was a lot of politics at play so they asked for the army to come in and there we uh you know when we went into that district i remember dosa district in south rajasthan southeast rajasthan and and i was a major and you know went with my column and five other tribe we reach we talked to the you know, collector and the sp the sp is sitting in his office is he's, he's not out in the field and trying to sort out the thing he's sitting in his office and and then we said no uh, he said yeah, yeah we can camp here and we can do this and i said no no i'm going to go where the problem is and you got to be there that you come to solve that and so you know there was a couple of this uh, sdms and they have to sign this legal document if mm-hmm. the army has to take action so they were there with us and a couple of cops were there the in, you know inspectors and stuff mm-hmm. and they stayed with us for a week at the end of it they told me that you know sab th- there's a difference between the police and the army mm-hmm. is that in the army the officers are always with the men they are not sitting in their palaces and giving orders they are there with the men doing things and and you know they take care of the men mm-hmm. that's a stark difference and that is something that you don't find in any other organization you know other than the armed forces very true uh, you indeed have skin in the game and that is extremely relevant for a leader so um uh, now we move on to the last leg of the conversation and it will revolve around the spouses in the indian army and the army brats so let's start with the army brats so from vinod khosla the founder of khosla ventures and done tremendous work uh, in tech space in the us to priyanka chopra the un goodwill ambassador and many other laurels to her they all have one thing in common that they their the parents were in the indian armed forces there are many other examples like the priyanka chopras and the and vinod khoslas who have gone on to do incredible things in the private sector uh, and the well outside of the army why does that happen what are five six distinguishing factors that the army brats will have versus the kids who study or live a civilian life what are those those five six things that uh, actually <laughs> yeah 
you know, it's it's there's one word for it. It's actually diversity. You know, when when you actually uh, sort of uh, look through all of those other factors that may come to your mind, right? diversity of uh, exposure, experience, interacting with people, uh, diversity of uh, in terms of experience, right? Uh, the kind of places that they live in, the kind of uh, schools that they go to, uh, the kind of difficulties that they face because of being in those so-called places that are not happening. And I let me, I, I'll elaborate on that. Um, so Amiyos' uh, children, right? They will, they will live in small towns. They will go and study in schools that are available nearby, right? Uh, it's very recently in the last 15, 20 years that there are, the army has also started building their own schools and you know setting it up. For that, it's all you know wherever you go, you go and study. And, and, and my, uh, you know, I'm, I'm my father was not in the army; he was in he was in the raw and IB, right? And mm-hmm. So, so and he joined the IB in 1958, uh, and and we've lived in small towns and places where. The local school was a missionary school run by a few nuns, and you know, you just go and do whatever you have. And so, so it, it exposes you to all kinds of things. Your, you know, your classmates are not those English-speaking Mercedes-driven kids who aspire to go to Harvard. They are, they are kids who are who are probably the first generation in the family who's come to school. Some of them. Others have come from small villages. Their fathers are soldiers and. Uh, their aspirations are very, very different from your aspirations. Uh, you, you know, by virtue of living in a small town, when you say, I want to apply to St. Stephen's College, your application doesn't reach. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the postal system doesn't, mm-hmm. didn't help you. Uh, and, and, and and you see your parents and their peers and, you know, your, your social circle going through uh, a not very easy life. Whether you're an officer or a soldier's child, you know, it's not an easy life. You see your fathers disappearing for months and end, uh, you know, and not turning up in school for your functions and stuff. And you've got, you know, you see your mother managing all of that, and they say, okay, this works. It's not, a, it's not the end of the world. Mm-hmm. And and they have this grit, and they want to come out of that and do something great, you know. And and if you actually look at people who are doing great stuff, they most of them are not come from comfortable backgrounds. They've not. They they want to do something that that you know gets them to the next level whatever the next level is in their mind you know whether it is money or it is fame or success in terms of you know being a leader in an organization whatever it is uh, it comes because they have these diverse experiences it doesn't come because they were all you know in dps mathura road and went to school in an air conditioned bus and then when they wanted to play for football their parents got them the best football shoes in the world and they played on astroturf and then they went and won the World Cup. No, the people who won the World Cup don't come from that, mm-hmm. right? And so, so in a, in a sense, it is these kind of people who have these kind of experiences. They come out and they say, anything works, everything is okay. You know, there is no difficulty that you can you cannot overcome. And and that really helps them. And it, they, in in that sense, they are better than the people who are actually serving. Because mm-hmm. you know, I joined when I was eighteen. But my daughter's seen this from the time she was born. Yeah. Wow. This is uh, truly remarkable. And now, sir, we now we are seeing a, a transition in the demographic profile of the people who become officers. There's a trend when many lady officers are also graduating from the IMA and the the OTA, so on and so forth. What's the usual lifestyle for a spouse? of someone who is a serving officer in the in the armed forces what are the career prospects what opportunities are they bestowed with to make the best use of the opportunity so the and goes of, uh, and goes both both ways both for men sorry. and yeah yeah so look it's a, it's it's a you know this society is changing right um 20 30 years ago uh, women who married army officers would either you know give up on their aspirations and say this is this is what i have to live with or they would compromise and find something that works like you know you become a teacher which is like transferable you can go anywhere and become a teacher 
and wherever you go there are schools where they don't have teachers there you would find mostly especially the army army officers and talk about air force and naval little different because they live in bigger cities so it's always been culturally a little different you know naval officers wives have always been able to do a better job of managing their own personal careers and stuff on average in army it's it's not easy because you're posted in a crew near jammu you know and you want to work in a big company how does it work you either say okay you know we're going to stay separately and make it work or you say okay i give that up and come to you know and live with whatever we got so it's always been there and now times are changing uh you know there are so many opportunities there is and more than opportunities communication everybody knows that there is this opportunity you know you can do so many things uh, girls want to do things and uh, there is there are problems uh, you know in terms of expectations and you know there are there are, there are these these social issues um, when 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 the male officers get married the women come they have aspiration they find it's not working out so they want to stay in a in a city where they, their career works then this officer comes back to a place where the families are permitted but the wife doesn't cannot come because she has a career in another place right so so there are issues like that which are coming up even when, when it's lady officers women officers the reverse happens because the husband in india would it, you know would it work if the husband says i'm not going to be working i'm going to work stay with my wife right which a lot of women do but men don't do that they they would want to continue to work so they typically live in different towns and cities and manage whenever they can there are also another breed of people who are husband and wife both in the forces right and the armed forces adjust them in by saying that look every alternate posting will try to get you together where it works right and they try to do that to somehow you know manage this but it's not easy it's it's not easy it's not as simple and it's not a binary to say look it's happening in the us and israel and you know in india women should be given our society is very very different it it's not as easy as that in our own you know armed forces when women came in the first time 1993 uh you know, they were given special treatment because the men who were senior leaders did not know what to do you can't blame them because they have never you know they've been in an organization for 25 30 years and suddenly there is this set of women who come in you know you can't they can't use the same bathroom to begin with right which is okay in a in a building you can say this bathroom is now meant for women only and there will be just this one woman in 700 who who's who uses that bathroom but when you go out to camp in tents as men as officers we don't say i i don't insist on a tent that is a bathroom i manage with what is there you know i go with the men and you know go in the dark and just do it women can't do that so which means that now the organization has to make concessions uh, which are operationally different for the women and which leads to resentment and unhappiness and then you know on both sides the women say look i'm being discriminated against or the men will say look uh, and i see, i know a live example 1994 one of my postmates was in, in signals communication you know he, he came on a on a on a short trip when he was staying in our unit and we, we met in the mess to have a drink and he says look i'm really frustrated because this lady officer who's come in my co doesn't give her night duty and there are three lieutenants so because this woman doesn't get night duty the other two men have to constantly keep doing night duties because somebody has to do night duty yeah. in the communication center so there is resentment right and and so what's the way out of it is the co says i don't care whether you're man or woman this is job to be done you do it and when when you do that the women say oh you're being harsh on me you're not understanding my problem so the army armed forces have gone through this for the last 25 years right you learn lessons and you come out i remember another incident you know where a woman officer from the ordnance services you know which does the logistics mm-hmm. she came to our unit for uh, we have a lot of equipment and stuff which needs to be uh, turned over when it goes bad and so this woman officer has come in to assess the uh, you know the the fitness of that thing mm-hmm. and then she says oh this is bad it goes back and we get the new stuff and something like that so she came in and she was like all gung ho and she start so some guys at some ncos are not done their work their document you know she abused them okay mm-hmm. she abused them in their conversation and these these people didn't take it and they came to me and uh, they said uh, so you know it's up she's saying this and all that so i had to call her and tell her that look the right to abuse does not come randomly you know it's not about male and female it is about you know as their their officer in their unit 
in that unit the men that i have stayed with live with in bunkers and you know trained and done a lot of stuff if i abuse them in a moment of you know anger they will take it from me they will not take it from you because you come from outside they don't know you and the same holds good for me if i go to another unit and abuse the men there they will not take it from me it's not about men and women so the women it took them time to understand because they had seen you know the male officers they said okay in an infantry unit or artillery unit yeah go on do it and this and that they come and try to do the same thing they said no no sorry it doesn't work like that you got to earn that you know the right to abuse if i may say that if the right to abuse is it comes it doesn't come easily it comes from proving yourself a lot and and you know telling this people in your command look he deserves to do this is when he abuses me he is doing it for my good and i will take it i'm astonished that there's something called right to abuse but very fascinating and it's abuse is you know not in the sense that gali there and all that not not in that sense you know you just to be harsh with someone give them punishment yeah. or you know it's it, it's done and it, it is done constructively there's a way of doing it Yeah, very true. So now we have the permanent commission in the army for the women. And in terms of the career prospects, in terms of the promotional aspects, would they be at par with with men in every aspect? Uh, like you also mentioned that there are certain postings, certain scenarios where men will have to perform, but women will take the second seat. So how will that play into account for the women? when it, when it comes to promotions in the in the same service yeah, yeah you know if you ask me about policy i cannot comment on it but if you ask me about my personal opinion i personally i i believe that you know as long as you have a level playing field for men and women uh, and keeping a few considerations for women because they you know because of the biological needs you have to give that consideration apart from that if you have a level playing field uh, then there is i uh, there would be no uh you know there would be no problem uh right now that level playing field is not easy to establish like mm-hmm. in, you know women are joined nda and i asked people who were there do they have a separate squad where they they live separately and do things separately or are they embedded in the regular squadrons as just another cadet unfortunately they have a separate squad that's what i understand which is not going to help it's going to take that much longer for them to really get in, you know become cadet sushma something you know instead of lady cadet so and so who has who lives separately and who you know does things differently there are different standards to pass and at the end of all of that if they say that i expect the same career prospect that's not fair mm-hmm. right if you have the same playing field you say oh okay you know you have to pass the same test that everybody else is passing because that's the requirement of the of the organization that's that meets the organization goal and then you meet all of those and you say i expect the same promotion that the other guy does it's absolutely fair right and if you say no physically i am a little weak then don't go into that organization where you require their physical fitness because end of the day that organization is meant to achieve a certain goal it's meant to do some task so if you don't have for example physical fitness or you know say if you don't have that and you go into that organization you are compromising on the operational readiness of that unit but aren't those aspects taken into consideration during the selection procedure for the so, so look it's not yeah. like i said it's not a binary right it's a huge it's an organization with so many types of people with so many opinions the policy maker has an opinion the person who implements it has a certain kind of a view point it, it's a, it's a mix of all of that right but look at it i'll, I'll give you a small example now if let's say you are required to do 40 pushups as part of a physical test right it's not about 40 pushups it's about building the shoulder and arm strength to do your real work physical fitness is all about doing your real work right uh, are you able to uh, withstand the physical fatigue on your shoulder and arms while you're doing your actual work which may be manning a gun or fighting in the trenches or you know loading something in your truck mm-hmm. and you say okay for women it is only 20 push ups so that means their shoulder and arm strength is lesser than that of a man and when they have to do this loading a truck over 5 hours they may not be able to do it so what happens to the operational readiness of that unit right you got to look at it that way so you say okay maybe women are not suited for this particular role 
So you don't put them in a unit which requires 50, 40 push-ups. You put them in a place where 20 will do, right? And in the army, those kind of places may not lead to the same kind of promotions. Got it. Right? This, this is this is how it works. So, uh, so we're seeing. So we moved from agricultural revolution to industrial revolution to now we're seeing the AI revolution in some way or the other. How will that change the armed forces? Many jobs have, have, have changed. Many jobs are now dormant. They are non-existent. Army is still thriving. The Air Force is still thriving. And how, how will this technological revolution in like 10 years or 20 years change the dynamics of gender in the armed forces? And also how will it change the Indian armed forces at a larger scale? So, okay. So for this, you know, let's let's go back 150 years and and you know the time when uh, science and stuff started being used in artillery and i say artillery because that's i'm very close to that you know been there for 20 years you see earlier they used to have this top khana you know when cannon is laid and there's a ball of iron which is put inside and they just kind of adjust the aim and let go right and it go about 300 400 yards meters whatever and it will hit and hope that it hits something then it became very scientific. That artillery is like, uh, you know, you got to talk about trajectories and wind resistance and spin of the earth when you're firing 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers. It became scientific. Uh, did it reduce the number of people required to man a gun? That did not. You still need five people to man that small gun. You need nine people to man the bigger gun. Can you change something? Yes. Before, only, three, uh, only five people man it. Right? While a Russian gun, which is similar, there are nine people required. Uh, so, so it, you know, technology really does not uh, does not really reduce the need for manpower. It just changes the skills required by people. So, so you know, in the early 90s and 80s, I did my first computer course in 1987. I was in 10th class. And they said, no, oh, computers are coming and then everything will be done by computers. Today, you tell me how many people have lost their jobs. And everybody has a computer. They still work on it. This with men, people working on the computer. Similarly, in the armed forces, at the tactical or operational level, you will have technology. It will lead to a little, maybe 5%, 10% reduction in manpower and stuff. And an example, you, know, you have a digital fire control system mm-hmm. to fire artillery. You know, they used to plot on, you know, plot and then find the target. And find. It's a digital fire control system. So what is reduced in that? Instead of three people doing the plotting, now there is there are two people who are manning that, uh, you know, the console. Uh, but that third person, yes, he can be removed. But there is some other task which he was doing, which has not been taken away. Because there is people doing multiple things, right? Uh, in a unit, for example, there are 100, 100 vehicles, right? Can you remove those 100 and make it 50? Yeah. You can. Uh, and a live example of that is you've seen in newspapers, right? They say that that the third or second or third level of repairs and maintenance can be given to the private sector, mm-hmm. right? You don't need to maintain army armed forces workshops and you know to, to do all that. You can give you know Tata trucks, the second line of repairs, you know the base detail, you know things can be done by Tata. Mm-hmm. But when there is a war, will the Tata establishment go to? Uh, areas ahead of lay and deploy that stuff and work around the clock? Will they be able to hire and motivate and create legal, uh, you know, environment for their employees to go and do that? That will not happen, right? So because that will not happen, you need to maintain this this whole thing, which, which may not be used for 20 years. It may be used only once in 25 years, but it needs to be maintained. It's like an insurance policy, right? You pay premiums every every year. So, uh, very well said. So, coming back to the gender dynamic in the Indian Armed Forces, uh, how do other countries take care of it? Be it Pakistan, be it the US, be it Israel. What, so what's the situation you know, over there? Uh, it's gender diversity is really a function of the society more than anything else. You can't you can't superimpose a foreign, foreign concept uh, as it relates to the Armed Forces into India and say that we should have exactly the same things and, you know, we should do it because and and you know it's it's not about a few few people who are born and brought up and studied exposed to the in culture in the cities who have to do this. You talk about women who come from villages. Can we give them an opportunity to join as an officer or a soldier in the in the army? 
uh, if you can do that yes then we are getting closer to gender diversity is not about a few english speaking second generation army officers uh, kids who come in and join as officers and they say oh we've achieved this you know thing that's not the reality right uh, like you say women in the workforce is not those you know women wearing suits and working in a air condition office in bangalore it is that house help who comes every day and works in five houses that's also workforce right so so when we look at this it has, you have to look at the culture and the environment and it's not easy to change it and i'm not saying that look uh, men in the armed force army come from small villages they will not accept i think there's a general who said that very recently you know that, the, that they will not accept a woman commanding them so they will accept women commanding them it will take some time for them to get over it and that will happen when women have come and joined as other soldiers right they have lived with them they have been on patrol they have been they've standing on guard with them they have uh, you know they are helping to load those tons of ammunition into trucks and simultaneously they see a woman coming as a lieutenant and you know rising up the ranks and then they know that look women are equally good they they have done exactly the same thing that i am doing okay and so this woman when she comes to command me she i will give her my respect but if you say no no we have we'll have this 5% reserved for women and they will not go to this particular thing and they will not do this and they will not do that and then you say okay they should be given command and that's not fair right and that's not fair for the organization more than anything else it's not about some men sitting and looking at that uh, position it's about the organization it's the men uh, or, or the soldiers troops under your command have to accept your command for you to be successful it's not that you impose it on top of them and say hey look there is this woman has come and she's going to command you for tomorrow and you go to accept it will not work it will not work in war yeah uh fascinating and uh, two two last questions i know we have extended the podcast and it's largely because how fascinating of a personality you are and i am having such such wonderful time connecting with you and chatting with you on various aspects and the viewpoints that you're bringing are very very fascinating two questions the first one is pertains to the concept of defense attaches in various uh, embassies that uh, that india has what are defense attaches and how can how privileged or good or bad or, or that position is or revered that position is within the armed forces and uh, if someone wants to become a defense attache within the armed forces how how, how can they do that okay yeah so for, for this great question i mean uh, defense attaches really you know front line they're there they they're exposed to things that uh, uh you know others don't see or experience and on the other side they they are also seen by people you know uh in a very international environment and so in the in the armed forces anything that takes you out of the organization right in defense attache you're going out of the organization into a new environment so in the armed forces anything that puts you in a new environment that kind of a role is very very uh, sought after high profile and it's given to really the best people because see see you go back to diversity of experience and capability to adjust in a new environment and only the best people who can do that are put into exposed to such things because you don't can want you to also risk, explain right? to the audience who are defense attaches and what what is so, their role yeah, yeah. defense attach what do they do right the defense attaches in an embassy they are the military element or the representative of that country and they uh, engage with the uh host country and the others in military matters right which could be uh contracts to buy or sell equipment uh training right you have joint training it could be strategic uh engagements um it could be also you know in an adversarial environment you would want to be there to keep a you know keep a finger on the pulse right you like in pakistan there is a defense attache in china there is a defense attache in the us there is a defense attache friendly countries there they are adversarial also they are there why because you want to you want to be in touch uh, with the environment that is very specific to the armed forces through a person who understands it and 
who also has the additional ability to engage with diplomats, uh, politicians, and, and you know all kinds of people by virtue of uh, his or her exposure. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so it's a very very prestigious uh, role. In fact, one of my very good friends is, was was there in, in in one of these countries, and I, I cannot name that country, but I went and stayed with him on a holiday. Uh, you know, very close. You stay with them for ten days. Went around that city and country, and uh, it's it's a totally different kind of a a, a role and a responsibility. And those are people who typically go up in service. You know, they become senior leaders. Uh, so, not just a diplomatic role like a defense attaché, but also you have officers going to foreign countries and training teams. India has you know uh, these kind of engagement with certain smaller countries. We help them to train their armed forces. Uh, so we go and do that. Or you go on United Nations missions. Like I went on a UN mission to Congo. So I was there for a year. Uh, you know, in that. Uh, and, and so these are people are picked and chosen. And it's a very tough competition. You've got to be consistently doing extremely well in your, in your work, uh, in, your, in your learning, training, and all that. And then you're called and there's an interview. They will ask you about all things around the world. And I still remember for that Congo, I was called and they were in a seven, eight general sitting in that conference room. And they asked me that, um, you know, that people say that we are contributing to the UN in terms of troops and all of that. And it helps us in our foreign exchange because the UN pays us, you know, for the troops uh, that are deployed in the United Nations. And so, so we earn foreign exchange because of these UN missions. And what do you think about it? And so fortunately, I had, I read about this and I said, look, we have, we have foreign exchange at that point, I think 2005. A foreign exchange reserves are about 200, 200 billion dollars or something. Or maybe 150 billion dollars. I said, look, 150 billion dollars, how much do you think the UN mission, a thousand people in a battalion going will earn a, on the country? Not too much, mm -hmm. right? It, you, you do get some foreign exchange, but it's not enough to do anything to your foreign exchange reserves. You know, and, and I expanded on that and gave an answer, and which was which is like people said, oh, you know, you, you should have just agreed with that. And I said, no, no, I don't agree with it. And they liked it. They liked it because that was the right thing. That is the, that is the fact. The, the, our contribution to UN missions does not significantly change our foreign exchange reserves. Yeah, <laughs> makes a lot of logical sense. But uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good brief about the defense attaches uh, attached to various uh, embassies. And, and in terms of the... Uh, selection procedure, are there, is there any specific number of years that you have to put into the services to be eligible to, to be an attaché in foreign, foreign missions? I mean, it's like, it depends on the country, right? The U.S. has many uh, probably officers from all the services each, you know, and their senior people. Smaller countries may have a lieutenant colonel, right? U.S. may have a brigadier. It depends on the kind of country that you're going, the kind of relationship you have, the kind of engagements we have, uh, you know, with that country, it de depends on that. So it's it's you know more more from that point. Oh. And one last question, and it's about uh, your preferences. So you mentioned briefly that your father was in the RAW and has also worked with the IB. You, on the other hand, went to the army, and I'm of the assumption, at least I don't know of this, but you you never took a reputation in in the RAW or the IB during your tenure mm -hmm. in the army, right? So, no. if we were to compare the two lifestyles, how would how would those two comparisons stack over each other? It's it's, it's very very different, um, and I don't want to you know I, I mean I don't want to get into that conversation about uh, what service or what what is what and stuff like that. I'm seeing it purely from a you know an employee point of view. I've seen my father; he's not an IPS officer. He's one of the few people who joined in the first batch when India decided that we want an intelligence. You know, organization and this, they, he joined, I think, on the first or second batch in 1958. My father is now 87 years old. So, you know, and then by the way, one of his colleagues came with the Dalai Lama from, from Tibet and all that. You know? so, so, so it's a really old thing, right? Uh, and so, so from my experience, I, and this is from the experience of uh, the brat or a child of uh, an officer who's not IPS, right? Is and he tell, he now he opens up a little bit and tells me, like you basically have to fend for yourself. It's, 
He's, he's, we've seen that. You go, you go to a small town you go, or, or like in the army, you go to a difficult place, your family is taken care of. You just start. You just left to fend for yourself, uh, and uh, it was a difficult life, much much more difficult than what the army, or, you know, officers and their families go through. Very very difficult. Um, there and and of course there is you know at the top of it there is a glass ceiling beyond which is only IPS and IAS officers and the the main cadre of intelligence officers. They want them. It may be different now. I cannot comment on that, but I can only talk about the experiences that you know that my father has shared with me. And so that is like uh, you know if, when you see that as a young you know you're a teenager or a child and then you say I don't know I don't want to go and do this uh, you know it doesn't and on top of that you see in the intelligence services you cannot talk about it. so your families don't know what you're doing mm -hmm. right so my father used to say you know school they'll ask what's your, what does your father do you know got to put an occupation so he would say central government so what the hell does that you know central government this is me uh, you know, and then say, no, what? So, okay, central government, but what? And as a kid, you can't explain to your friends what mm -hmm. your father is doing. Right? It's not easy. And your father obviously will not come and, or your mother will not come and tell you, you know, we did this and all. We don't talk about it. In the army, it's very, very visible. You're part of that whole thing, socially at least, you know, and you see what your father is doing. Your, 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 you know, your, your parents' friends are doing and, you know, you're exposed to all that. You see all that. In the intelligence services, you don't. You're not supposed to. Is there any so any any anything, somebody to do. Is, is there anything that you loved about about that journey of your father being in the raw? Except that you know you move to new places every two three years. Uh, mm -hmm. no, frankly, nothing much. As a, as a family, you know, member of somebody in the intelligence service, is nothing much. I remember that you know that my, my my father went to one of these. I will not name that country, though it is a long time ago. But I don't want to get into the. And he went to one of these countries which was having a revolution, and then they landed up on some some mission, and they, they had to be ex, extra, extracted from there. We were kids; we didn't know about all this. He told us 25 years after he retired, and so he was in a lot of danger with you know, a bunch of people, uh, and nobody knows about it. We are living in a small town, and nobody's mm -hmm. there to support us. And you know, my mother was really worried. Uh, it's not easy, uh, and that. Does not happen in the army, you know, when you go and deploy. It doesn't. That's not the way it works. Wow, this was truly incredible, and I mean this. I uh, absolutely loved every minute of the podcast, uh, Ibrahim, and it was so good to connect with you after such a way, such a long time. And uh, do you have any last words for the folks who are watching this episode? And most of them would be in the early twenties to late twenties. That's the analytics that the YouTube shows me. So, any advice for them? Yeah, I, I, have, I have just just one advice, and and this is from my own personal experience, and also from what I have seen, you know, around me. Uh, the one thing that is going to get you to where you want to be, and this is not just about money or position or fame or object, wherever you want to be, is is persistence and grit. Uh, you know, not giving up. Uh, okay, and is 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 what is going to going to get you what you want, um, and and that that takes that takes you know patience, effort, uh, and and other things like you know being able to learn uh, you know new things, but it's persistence and grit that is going to get you to what wherever you want to go. You know even if it is. To say that, look, I don't want to do anything and relax and enjoy life. It takes effort to be able to get there. You know, it's 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 not easy. So uh, that is my advice: uh, stick to what you have. Don't be afraid of what people are. You know, people may tell you, stick to it and and do it right enough and long enough, and you'll get there. Beautiful. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Ibrahim. Wonderful to connect with you. reconnect with you and look forward to speaking in person if and when that happens absolutely and um, all the very best in all the incredible work that you're doing thank you thank you very much bye bye